that are usually together in the same room. Um, we are not together in the same room, obviously, and this is a first experience for us and for the city council. Um, when Governor Baker signed an emergency order on March 10th, allowing legislative bodies to conduct meetings with all participants being remote and without a quorum needing to be in the room together, I had decided at that point that the council would meet that way today on the 19th. That's because we know that the very best way to protect the public and the city representatives is to practice social distancing and to not meet in groups. Then over this last week, holding this meeting remotely has become less of a proactive choice and become a necessity because uh, to protect everyone's health and because municipal buildings are closed to the public. So here we are, we're with you from our own locations. And while we're all physically apart, um, I view this actually as very unifying. We're sitting in the wards in Northampton and Florence and Leeds um, that we represent. And we are with you, the people that we represent. So uh, we're all doing this for the common good and for the safety of all in our community. And to me, that's the very purpose of local government. So uh, I thank you to everyone who's pulled together to make this happen. It wasn't easy and we've all really had to bend and be flexible. We ask for your patience and understanding if it takes some time to move through the items on the agenda. There may be pauses and silence. Um, I wanna make sure that everyone's being recognized and uh, I, we might need to check and make sure that things are working. So please be patient with us. Um, if you don't wanna participate in public comment, as I said, we ask that you watch on Northampton Open Media on channel 15 or northamptonopenmedia.org. Um, the recording of this meeting as always will be available on Northampton Open Media's government video archive channel on YouTube. Uh, I wanna offer huge thanks to Northampton Open Media for working with us to ensure that the same public access that they always provide um, is available uh, in this new way of meeting for us. They provide a remarkable service to our community and we thank them. Um, so we are going to start our real time public comment um, as we always do. And it was really important to me that we continue that practice. Um, we always encourage people to also comment by uh, emailing us at citycouncil at northamptonma.gov. Um, so I'm going to um, go, as I said, one by one and um, unmute people and ask if they wish to make a comment. If you say yes, I ask that you state your name, your city or town for the public record. Um, to ensure that everyone has equal opportunity to speak, we ask that you limit your comments to three minutes. After three minutes, I'll ask you to finish your sentence. Uh, per council rules, we do not respond during public comment as it is your time to speak. Um, and uh, you'll, so you'll understand if we don't respond to you. Um, and as this is a little bit different for us and this is an open line where anyone can come on, I will, um, I will do my best to act quickly if someone is clearly acting in a way that's inappropriate or not something that we would do in council chambers. Um, but other than that, you are welcome to uh, talk to us on any topic. It doesn't have to be on the agenda. So I am going to go through and I'm gonna, as I said, go one by one and ask people if they would like to comment. Um, Mr. Mojo, are you on? Yes. Hi, would you like to make a public comment? Well, I, yes. I uh, saw, I sent an email to all of you today. I just wanted to make sure you all got that and read it. I just feel as though uh, the only matter I want to say is that I don't know if this is the right format to um, make uh, non-emergency uh, decisions on. Uh, so that's just a concern of mine. And I kind of just put it all in the email and uh, hopefully you all read it and, and that's it. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. I would vote to to table this, uh, the ordinance change, I guess, is what I'm looking for tonight. Okay. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, would you, is, oh, is this Councilor LaBarge? Wait. Uh, this is me. 7937 is you? Yeah, I don't know how come I'm on that. 
Uh, give me one sec. I'm going to change the name on here so I don't keep clicking on you. Everyone, give me a moment. Okay. Um, hold up. Let me work through this list. Hi, K G M. Would you uh, K G M iPhone K J M iPhone? Would you like to make a public comment? K G M iPhone. Yes. No. Okay. Moving on. Next caller. Um, I promise to stop doing that. Uh. John. John, would you like to make a public comment? Guessing not. Uh, no comment. Okay, excellent. Hey, thanks for telling me. Um, There, um, I don't know if people see a raise hand feature. If you do see it and want to raise your hand, that would greatly help me in figuring out who wants to comment. It looks like Steve Connor is uh, said in the chat um, box that he would like to speak for a minute at some point. So you Excellent. know. All right. Um, thank you for telling me that. I don't have that open because I've got such a long list. Steve. Would you like to comment? I'm going to unmute you. OK, we both did it. All right. Yeah, I just wanted, because you said this was also going to be recorded, um, I'm hoping that other citizens within Northampton um, watch this. I want to let people know that our office, Veterans Services, is still open for business. We are still taking applications. We are still reaching out to veterans and their dependents and trying to get them all the services that they need. We are answering all text messages, emails, and phone calls. So um, I just want to encourage people to keep reaching out to us in these very difficult times um, that we're here to help. And, um, I've, I've been in the office for a couple of days. My staff, everybody's going in for a period of time to meet the needs. So please don't be afraid to call us and, and to just, if you find like you've lost your job or you've been underemployed and you're a veteran or a family member, please get in touch with us because we're here to help. And I just want to make sure it gets out there. Thank you so much, Steve. Okay, um, next up, Jen, I have unmuted you to ask if you want to participate in public comment. Uh, I am all set for public comment at the time, hon. Awesome, thank you, I'm gonna mute you again. Okay. Um, John, I asked. Linda's iPad. I have unmuted you. Linda, would you like to comment from your iPad? Linda, can you hear us? It's okay if you don't want to. Okay. I'm going to take that as a note. Uh, Darren Moulton, I have unmuted you to ask if you want to participate in public comment. I just want to say hello and I, I and let you know that um, th thanks to Karen, I knew how to get on to Northampton Open what media or whatever. But when I got on it, it said it was live streaming, 
and all I saw was this still picture of you and I heard nothing. So she had also sent the link to, you know, to do it, um, it Zoom. And so I, I used the Zoom link, but I'm just letting you know that at least on, on my laptop up here in Leeds, I, I opened it up and there it was, but it wasn't, it wasn't streaming. Okay, thanks for letting us know that. Um, NCTV is, or sorry, Northampton Open Media is on right now. So um, they are, uh, are looking at that and I have a message from them saying there was a new link, a new link generated for YouTube because it timed out. I'm going to read this link. It's uh, not the easiest URL, um, but I think if you go to their site, you. Well, can... I'm going to stay. I'm going to stay with you. Uh, you know, I'm. I do a lot of stuff on Zoom, so. Okay. Awesome. You are welcome. Uh, you're welcome to stay as long as you like. Um, okay. Are, if you're, are, are you done, Sharon? I'm going to mute you again. Yep. If... yep. Um, I am so. Uh, Northampton Open Media says we put it on Facebook as well as in the Northampton MA group, um, the new link for, I guess, the live stream. Um, okay. Uh, M. Tebow. Oh, hold on. There you are. Would you like to public make a public comment? Thank you, but no comment at this time. Okay, thanks. Uh, Christine, I have unmuted you to ask if you'd like to provide a public comment. Christine? Okay. Oh, oh, excellent. Mike? Thank you, I see that. Michael McCreary, I'm trying to unmute you. Do you have, I see that your hand is up and that you want to comment. I, um, can you unmute your own audio? Because it's not letting me unmute you. Michael McCreary. I think it might be Susan McCreary who sent it. Hi, this earlier. is Susan. Oh, great. You Sorry. Hey, you, Hi. you come up as Michael. I apologize. I know it's my husband's. It's okay. I am on because I'm interested in the city ordinance regarding the variance changes. And there's been a lot of community input on this matter. And I'd like to see it tabled at this time so that more people can have input in the future when things are a little bit different. Can okay. you hear me? I, oh, yes, I can hear you. I'm sorry. Okay. So public comment, we don't respond, but um, I we do oh, hear okay. Good. Thumbs up. people sure. can hear, right? Yes, yes, I see nods. So we, we can hear you. Yeah, we're here. Okay, good. Okay, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Okay, who do we have left? So um, it looks like the raise hand function does work. Uh, so if you see it, feel free to use it. Otherwise, I want, because I really want to make sure. Um, also, I don't know if you can see a chat function. If you do want to comment and I haven't gotten to you yet, um, um, then can you please put that in the chat to me? I want to make sure that I don't miss anybody. Uh, I think I have called on everybody. Uh, well, let me see. I think some, uh, there's one person. Peg Conniff, would you like to comment? Peg? Okay, I think, I think Peg's uh, just watching. But if you change your mind, let me know. 
Um, bear with me, everybody. Okay. I, oh, hold on, one other person just came in. I just, whoops, uh-oh. Um, Paul, Paul Bockelman, would you like to comment? Hmm. Paul Bockelman, are you interested in making a public comment? No. Excellent, thank you for telling me. Um, all right. Uh, anyone, I'm going to give everyone another a minute to message me. I'm getting messages. So if you do want to comment and I have yet to call on you, please let me know. Okay. All right. Hi. Um, I think we are going to close. Hold on. One more person just came in. Um, the person who just joined, would you like to pub comment uh, during public comment? Where'd you go? Hey, meetings, would you like to comment? No, thank you. Okay, thanks. All right, so um, thank you everyone. This was our first try at doing public comment this way. Um, and I think it largely worked. So thank you for your patience and for doing that and helping us um, try this new way of having our meeting. Um, we are going to, um, I'm just making sure everything's said here. Okay, so public <coughs> being done. Again, if you, anyone who um, wants to stay and watch, uh, you're welcome to stay and watch this way. You're also welcome to go over to Northampton Open Media and watch or go to Channel 15 and watch. Um, if you are going to stay, I'm going to ask that you please mute your microphones. Um, also, if uh, if you have speakerphone on or anything like that, please um, take that off. Um, okay, so public comment is closed, and we're going to convene the meeting. Um, Laura, will you please call the roll? Yes, Councillor Dwight. Oh, I guess they have to be unmuted to respond. Yeah. Councillor yeah. Dwight? Oh, I think I saw a gesture. Um, Hi, uh, yes, a long time listener, first time caller. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Foster? Here. Councillor Jarrett? Here. Councillor Labarge? Yes. Councillor Maori? Here. Councillor Nash, not present. Councillor Quinlan. Here. Councillor Shara. Here. And Councillor Thorpe. Here. Madam Chair, you have a quorum. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, okay. First up on our agenda, um, it, it, the announcement of a public hearing. Uh, this is a public hearing to consider the FY 2021 water and sewer rates. I am going to read this. Um, I'm going to just apologize, and this goes for the rest of the meeting. I've got two laptops going to have both things happening at once, so I'm going to have to turn from the camera to read from the other laptop through this whole meeting. So apologies 
you get my profile. I don't think it's my good side. Um, okay. City <laughs> Council, March 19th, 2020, upon the recommendation of the mayor, 20.032, uh, in order to establish water and sewer rates for FY 2021, order that effective July 1, 2020, and the per 100 cubic foot CCF rates for water and sewer for fiscal year 2021 will remain unchanged from fiscal year 2020. Rates will remain as follows. Water, customers with one inch meter or smaller, tier one consumption, zero to 16 CCF, $4.51 per CCF. Tier two consumption, uh, greater than 16 CCF, $6.09 per CCF. Customers with meter larger than one inch, all consumption, $5.99 per CCF. Sewer, non-metered seven dollars and 86 cents per ccf based on 80 percent of metered water consumption fy rate was seven dollars and 67 cents metered seven dollars and 86 cents per ccf fy 19 rate seven dollars and 67 cents so we are announcing um the public hearing hold up um for um, for those rates, uh, by order of the city council, a public hearing will be held on Thursday, April 2nd. Um, hold on one second. I'm uh, letting somebody else in over here. Okay, uh, by order of the city council, a public hearing will be held on Thursday, April 2nd, 2020 at 7.05. 5 p.m. in Council Chambers, 212 Main Street, Northampton, MA. The City Council will consider the proposed FY 2021 water and sewer rates and hear all persons who wish to be heard thereon. So that is the announcement of that public hearing. Next, we are going to move to um, any updates from committee chairs. And uh, hold on, let me hold on one second. I'm trying to see you all again because now I can only see the screen. Um, oh dear. Okay. Um, oh, okay. Counselor Dwight. Uh, and just uh, it's it's probably obvious to a lot of people, but right now um, we have we're as we're struggling to try and figure out how we're going to conduct our committees in a similar fashion to this. Probably um, it's going to be clunky. The legislative matters committee, the the community services, all those committees are all going to be likewise challenged. And you know, I think we're up to it. But the fact is, is if I recommend that anyone watching now want to check the city website frequently for updates on when the meetings will be convened, how they'll be convened, um, and uh, also check for uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, bulletins from the, the mayor's been very good about that on social media, on the website, the newspaper as well. The Daily Hampshire Gazette is now offering free access to their website um, for citizens to learn more and know what's being done in the community and how it's being impacted. Um, so I, I recommend all those. And plus you actually have an opportunity to contact any one of us. Um, it's not like we're doing anything. We're just sort of sitting here staring at it, at, you know, whoever's in our house. So please, we probably welcome a call if you want to call or if you want to text or you want to write, um, we can we can probably get you in the right place with the right amount of information. That's it. Thank you. Other counts, other committee chairs? Um, yes, Councilor Labarge speaking, please. Um, I just want to let everybody know that there is a cancellation for Friday, March 20th at 4 p.m., um, which was going to be held at 115 Glendale Road. Um, and it was going to be for the wall raising ceremony for a future homeowner 
um, of raising that first wall. So right now I have talked with the director of Habitat for Humanity, and we will let everybody know when we're going to reschedule the date. Excellent. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so kind of rolling into um, other announcements, one-minute announcements. Do, are there other counselors who have other announcements to make? Oh, Counselor I've, Yuri. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, yeah, I just wanted to, to mention a couple of volunteer opportunities I'm sure most of you are aware of on the council, but <clears throat> the Highland Valley Elder Service is looking for drivers, um, especially now they're desperately seeking actually drivers um, for their Meals on Wheels. Um, you can email Nancy M, as in the letter, Nancy M at highlandvalley.org. That's Nancy Mathers and find out more uh, details about that. And also there's the Massachusetts Medical Reserve Corps that is, um, um, you can reach at uh, and find out more information at maresponds.org. They're looking for um, a crew of, of volunteers for Hampshire County, you don't have to be a medical person or a public health professional to volunteer for them. There's a registration form if you go to that website and um, they can and they ask you questions about yourself and they would give you an appropriate placement so i would consider that if you're looking for a way to help now in this current crisis or in any uh, emergency in the future thank you excellent thank you counselors other announcements i do not See other raised hand. Oh, Councilor Jarrett. Oh, your hand was raised. Uh, you're still muted. Unmuted. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Great. Um, so I wanted to bring up a couple of other organizations that are doing uh, good work uh, in this time. Um, the Pioneer Valley Workers Center and the Western Mass Area Labor Federation are organizing around getting, making sure people get paid sick leave, the, have the right to leave work if you have health concerns, uh, eviction, foreclosure, and debt issues, and um, we're working on issues of releasing incarcerated people who aren't a risk to the public. Uh, so I think this is a time, you know, both to prioritize public health and realize that um, we are not now and never have been equally impacted by uh, the concerns that our society faces and need to stand together. Um, if you're a worker with concerns, the Pioneer Valley Worker Center has a 24-hour hotline, which is 413-351-2300. Uh, another uh, ish, um, resource is Western Mass Mutual Aid, and um, <clears throat> Councillor Foster linked to it in her recent email newsletter. If you search for that, you can, it can take a bit, but you can get to that. I'm happy to also, you can con you know, feel free to contact me. And so that's um, people who are working on, there's, they've created the whole spreadsheet of needs. So there's, you can post things that you need in all different areas or things that you are offering and connecting people. Um, I'd also like to encourage people to uh, do more neighborhood connections with regard to the email lists. So specifically for Ward 5, we have uh, the Bay State Village uh, Google group. Um, a lot of people are using nextdoor.com. There's also Florence Center neighbors uh, are organizing and there's an email address to contact um, the organizer for that. It's florencecommunityma at gmail.com. And also just want to encourage people to contact me with any questions or concerns that you have. I'm happy to connect you and uh, also help you build. If you're looking to build a neighborhood list uh, for you know, your local neighborhood, I have a lot of contacts in various neighborhoods in Ward 5, so I could help get that going off the ground. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, any other one minute announcements? Okay, seeing 
None. Um, Mr. Mayor, uh, I'm going to unmute you. Do you um, have any communications for us? Thank you, counselors. Um, uh, I just basically wanted to give a quick overview of uh, where we are right now in the city of Northampton in terms of our ongoing response to the co coronavirus COVID-19 outbreak. Um, as you know, both the Commonwealth and the city are, have declared a state of emergency. Um, last Friday, we closed all of our municipal buildings to the public. Um, our libraries followed suit and our schools uh, followed suit effective um, Monday of this week. Um, then, as we know, the governor uh, made some additional modifications to his initial order um, around uh, around sizes of gatherings, et cetera. Um, so we did an update on Tuesday um, and actually sort of changed our posture even more in terms of um, city buildings continuing to be closed to the public. Um, obviously, schools continue to be closed, um, but we have begun to uh, with the exception of emergency personnel, uh, we've begun to have non-emergency uh, personnel uh, begin working remotely um, wherever it's possible in our city departments. Um, we do have skeleton crews that are working in the um, various buildings um, to make sure that the essential functions of government continue to work. Obviously our public safety, our public works, our dispatch, um, all of those um, public safety related agencies continue to be uh, fully operational, um, although we are taking um, um, significant measures to try to protect their safety um, as they are on the front line in many cases of responding um, to those who are seeking uh, medical assistance um, and or working with um, nursing homes uh, that may need transport to the hospital. Um, so in terms of, um, you've mentioned our IT department, our IT department has done um, incredible work, um, not only helping us figure out uh, these sorts of um, you know, Zoom meetings, but also um, getting remote operations going for many of our workers so that they can continue uh, to provide the services uh, remotely. You heard from Steve Connor earlier, uh, veterans and seniors and uh, all of our other um, departments continue to um, uh, remain in contact, uh, phones are being answered or, or, and messages returned, email are being, uh, are being answered, um, and we're doing our best to provide information to people um, as, as the requests come in to us. Um, you know, the governor has uh, lowered the, uh, the governor had issued a maximum of 25 individuals. He lowered it from 250 to 25. Um, in terms of gathering. Obviously, the president has uh, lowered that further to 10. Um, and, and obviously, the governor has also um, ended all on-premise consumption of food or drink at bars and restaurants. Um, and some restaurants are continuing to provide some takeout service where possible. Um, but the big message, I think, that we have to continue to reiterate um, as we watch this um, outbreak unfold, we saw a major jump both nationally today um, in the number of cases um, and including in Massachusetts, we saw a significant increase um, in the number of cases. Obviously, we've you've all read the reports of the confirmed uh, cases in Hampshire County at Cooley Dickinson. Um, so watching this unfold, we have to continue to reiterate to people uh, that they need to uh, social distance themselves. Um, the reason we have closed schools um, is because we want people to um, avoid uh, contact, um, social contact whenever possible um, and not spread this virus. Um, and, uh, and, you know, the best research shows us that this is one of the key ways to do it. So we really want to urge people um, to, to follow the advice of our medical experts and to, um, to the extent possible. Obviously, we know some people have to go to work, um, have to um, uh, do other uh, things for their family, um, but those other kinds of communal activities, they really need to avoid them at all cost. Um, many of you have seen the article about uh, this not being a snow day, um, uh, and, and I think that's very poignant, particularly for our, our uh, school children and families. We really need to try as hard it is, as hard as it is, for um, young people to not be.
be with their friends and not to do things socially. Um, this time that we spend um, isolating ourselves could be um, significant in terms of limiting uh, the impact. And obviously we're most concerned about the impact on our healthcare system um, and our healthcare workers who are already um, uh, seeing exponential increases in the number of folks that are uh, contacting them, um, folks, and we see it playing out all around the state and around the nation. So I, I wanna continue, obviously we wanna continue to uh, taking personal care of ourselves, washing our hands um, 20 minutes, 20 seconds with soap, uh, sing whatever song you wanna sing, um, and, uh, and obviously making sure that we're being uh, clean in terms of surfaces, um, and there's lots of great information that we've assembled on our website. If you go to NorthamptonMA.gov uh, coronavirus, I want to thank Annie Lesko on my staff who has really been assembling not just information from the CDC and from DPH, but all of the sort of daily bulletins, um, information about volunteer activities, assembling some of the press information. Um, and it's really a place that people in the city can go to get information, get resources. Um, and uh, so I encourage people uh, to check that out. As we know, the governor has today announced some other measures um, that include the closure of daycare facilities um, beginning uh, next week and a transition to an emergency uh, daycare facility model that the state will be providing more information about. Um, and, um, and, and we are beginning to see some financial uh, resources talked about. Uh, the state legislature and the federal government have been uh, working on uh, standing up new programs through both the Small Business Administration, um, as well as uh, various aid packages, um, including from uh, uh, FEMA and MEMA, which we're already uh, working to try to figure out uh, what types of additional uh, support could come to support uh, not only our, our Board of Health, but our first responders. Um, so it continues to be a very fluid situation. I want folks to know that city government is continuing to function, even in this environment. Um, I have a, an emergency response team that is in constant contact. We're having uh, daily uh, meetings like this um, to monitor the situation across all of our departments. Um, and we're trying to do everything we can uh, to keep our community safe, um, but we need your help uh, in doing that. We really need every, um, every uh, individual uh, resident and family um, to, to do this together uh, to try to keep our community safe. Um, so that's sort of the, the quick update for this evening. Um, as I feel that there are significant changes, I will of course use our uh, reverse 911 system uh, to let people know about them. Um, we continue to try to push out as much information as we can on our social media channels. Um, obviously our school system uh, began its first uh, 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 feeding program today for school children, um, which I'm hearing great reports about um, so that uh, we can continue to serve uh, uh, school children who rely on our public schools for access uh, to healthy nutrition, both for breakfast and for lunch. Um, there's also a lot of other work being done um, by uh, nonprofits who we remain in close contact with, as well as all of our uh, social service agencies uh, that serve um, so many of the folks in our community who are most vulnerable. And we're also a uh, part of those conversations. So again, um, please visit our website. Please continue to contact uh, city departments if you have um, information uh, requests. We obviously ask people, um, given the fact that we are in this emergency posture, if you have non-essential types of questions that can wait, um, we are obviously will try to get to them, um, but our first priority is responding to the issues surrounding uh, the current uh, coronavirus or COVID-19 outbreak, um, and we want everyone to be safe, take care of themselves and their families, and, um, and hopefully our community and our commonwealth and our nation uh, we'll be able to get through this uh, very scary time. Thank you very much for, for that update, um, for those words in the scary time. Um, okay, uh, so the next item that we have on our agenda is um, a resolution. 
So this is 20.031, a resolution in support of the Empower Act. Um, this is a resolution on a second reading. It passed in first reading at our last meeting. Um, so this is where we're gonna try this out. I am gonna ask for a motion. I'll make a motion. Councilor's been, <laughs> Councilor <laughs> made the motion. Is that a second from Councilor Dwight? Sure. Okay, the motion's been made and seconded on the second reading of the resolution in support <laughs> of the Power Act, Empower Act. Um, is there discussion on second reading of this resolution? I'm looking for hands. I'm looking for indications. Okay. Seeing uh, Councilor Labarge, I'm going to check in. Any discussion from you? Hello. Hi. Is there any comment you'd like to make on the second reading of this resolution? Nope. I think we handled it on the first reading. Excellent. Okay. So, uh, seeing no discussion, Laura, roll call, please. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. And Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Okay, that passes in second reading. You've got our first vote done here. Well done, everybody. Okay. Um, moving on, the next item on the agenda is uh, we're moving on to the consent agenda. Uh, we only take one reading on the consent agenda, and if there was more than one item, I would ask if you wanted any removals to um, for discussion, because there's no discussion on the consent agenda, but there's only one item, and that item is uh, it's the minutes of March 5th, 2020. It's from our last meeting, so I will ask. Move uh, approval on the uh, consent agenda, it. please. Motion second it. by Councillor Dwight and seconded by Councillor Labarge. Um, is there any discussion on these minutes from March 5th? Seeing and hearing none, all those in favor of approving the minutes, please say aye. 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 Any objections? <laughs> I'm going to ask anyone who's watching and is not a counselor to not vote, please. <laughs> um, if, if line, uh, uh, any objections? And no one is abstaining. Okay, the minutes the consent agenda uh, have uh, passed. So now we are going to recess for finance as we always do. Um, so we're going to move into the finance committee meeting. All counselor, it's a joint um, meeting between the finance committee and the full council. All counselors can participate in the discussion, but only the counselors who serve on the finance committee, uh, which are myself, Councilor Labarge, Councilor, and, uh, and Councilor Thorpe. So all, only those counselors may vote during this portion, but anyone can participate in the discussion. Um, so, uh, Laura, will you please take the role of finance? Councillor Shara. Here. Councillor Labarge. Present. Councillor Quinlan. Here. And Councillor Thorpe. Here. Great, we are here. The first item on our agenda are the approval of minutes from the previous meeting, which was March 5th, 2020. I make a motion to approve those minutes. Okay, that motion was made by Councillor Quinlan, I think, and was seconded by Councillor Labarge. So yeah. it's made and seconded. Any discussion on these minutes? Hearing none, all those in favor of approving the minutes, 
please say aye. 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 Any objections from the four? No, and no one's abstaining. Okay. Those minutes have two of those minutes of help. Our first, uh, we have two financial orders. The first one is 20.033, an order for the FY 2020 budget transfers. I'm going to read it um, and then I will ask for a motion from the um, finance committee. And um, then I know that we have the um, finance director, Susan Wright, here um, to talk to us about it. So this is in city council. Um, I'm uh, I'm hearing before I start reading that. Um, I am getting reports that there's some feedback going on. So if everyone who is not actively participating could please mute, that would um, I think that would help with that. I'm scrolling through here to see if I've got any of those. Okay, hopefully that's going to help that. Um, okay, back to this order. So uh, upon in city council, March 19th, 2020, upon recommendation of the mayor, uh, FY 20.003, an order for FY 2020 budget transfers, order that the following budgetary transfers um, from the Department of City Council, OM description training and seminars, um, $300 uh, from city council advertising transfer um, $200 city council travel $700 city clerk for ballot printing $7,000 city clerk for ordinance updates $4,000 uh, debt interest on notes. Um, this is being transferred from here to those other um, uh, places $12,200. Um, so the total that's being transferred from uh, interest on notes is $12,200 being transferred to um, those other uh, two departments. Okay, so I have read it and now I'm going to ask for a motion for a positive recommendation. Motion okay, on I have... Councillor Shearer, I have some questions, please. Okay. Let's, uh, let's, I need a motion in a second to get it on the floor and then we'll go to discussion. Okay, Councillor Labarge? Sounds that, fine. That, are you going to make a motion? I'll make that motion. All second. right, my second? Second. That, that was Councillor Thorpe. Okay, excellent. Um, so motion's been made and seconded. So um, discussion, so I know, do you wanna ask your questions before we hear from um, Director Wright or the mayor? No, that's okay, let them speak first. Okay. Susan or? Yep, I'm yeah. ready. Great. Okay, so counselors, this is, um, as we come to the end of the fiscal year, we end up doing some of these budgetary transfers. We're basically moving money from one budget line item and our current budget to another budget line item. So you're going to probably see orders like this from now till the end of June. There actually will be quite a few this year because of the COVID-19 emergency. Um, but these two particular ones are related to just city council. Mostly this is money we're moving into your budget because more than uh, the usual number of counselors attended the MMA meeting in Boston. That's because we had, I think, so many new counselors. And then um, two of these transfers are for the city clerk for ballot printing and ordinance updates. And I suspect I'll have more um, transfers for you as we do the payroll for the uh, election that was held. So um, this is just the beginning of some of the budgetary transfers, which are pretty standard uh, at this time of year. Thank you. Um, Council Clark, did you, did you wanna? Yes, ask yes. I'd like to ask um, Susan Wright um, a couple of questions, please. Yeah, so Susan, so um, go ahead, and we're just going to acknowledge this is Susan Wright. She's the finance director for the city. Thank you. Susan, okay, at that 7000 on the ballot printing, that was for the municipal election, correct? Correct. 
Okay. Is there any additional election workers, like um, for that special election? And how is the city covering this extra expense? Because we know for a fact that we had the primary plus we had the municipal election. So that's not on here, correct? Correct. The payroll hasn't been completed for the election, so I don't know if I'm going to need extra money put into that line item. Those are salary line items now. Um, so these are just the um, operations and maintenance uh, overages that the city clerk has told me about. She hasn't okay. um, notified me of any other, um, any other deficits yet. Okay. So in other words, we will probably see other transfers coming up in the future on the election, correct? I, I believe we will. She had a good size budget to start with, so I'm not anticipating something dramatic, but um, I'm sure we'll have more. But she has okay. been so busy, she's unable to give me uh, all of her numbers yet. Right. On the um, OM, on the ordinance update at $4,000, um, I don't know, I'm kind of, I don't understand this because I'd like to know about how far back did we go on the updates, which we do with, you know, the books that we have on the codes and so forth. Do you know how far back at the $4,000 that we went to accumulate that $4,000? Like uh, how many updates? That I don't have um, a specific on that. Um she said she's been doing code book updates that have been put forth this fiscal year. And she's placing three more updates with general code that have been received this year. So I'm going to have to get more detail from her about um, specifically what um, the additional work has been. So I can I get to you the next meeting. Okay. Thank you very much, Susan. Can we just, Susan, could you just explain for the public that's watching what we're talking about? Because they may not know that that we have a vendor that anytime we do an update to our ordinances, anytime the city council changes a parking spot, anytime we then have to pay this online vendor to update our ordinance book online. Right, right. And the exactly. ordinances so are found on our website and, and keeping yes. them up to date is a priority. Yes, exactly. So it um, depending on the level of activity, in terms of um, changes to the ordinance, and that can be zoning, whatever, um, we we may get charged more or less depending on how much we're asking them to uh, modify our online ordinance. I just wanted for the public to know that what we were talking about. We don't charge by the ordinance, and we, you know, it's it's our code book vendor. Um. Okay. Are there any other questions or comments on? the budget transfers. Any other counselors? Okay. <coughs> Seeing none. Um, all those in favor of a positive recommendation, please say, all those in finance in favor of a positive recommendation, please say aye. 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 Any objections? And no one's abstaining. Okay. Moving on to the next financial order. This is 20.034, in order to appropriate free cash to public safety wireless project. Um, I'm going to read it and then I'm going to ask for a motion. This is. Uh, okay, in City Council, March 19th, 2019, upon recommendation of the mayor, 20.034, in order to appropriate free cash to public safety wireless project, ordered that $24,500 be appropriated from the FY 2020 general fund undesignated fund balance, free cash, to the IT department to replace the wireless system for the police station, fire station, and Florence Substation, uh, 19303586609. Okay. So now I'm looking for a motion from the members of finance. Make a motion. It's been made by Council of Bards for a positive recommendation and seconded by 
Second. Okay. Any discussion on? Oh, um, we're gonna have discussion on this. Um, Susan or Mayor Narkowitz, do you want to? Anything you want to say first before we ask questions? Uh, this is a, a fairly urgent project that IT has identified to update the wireless at our public safety buildings. And uh, this is why we're moving this forward um, prior to the capital plan, because uh, it's something that needs to be addressed right away, particularly with the emergency that we're in. OK, thank you. Um, questions or comments from counselors? Council the barge, anything you nope. would like to do? I'm fine with it. Okay. Um, um, oh, sorry, oh, Councilor Jarrett. I would just note that the date is incorrect. It says 2019 when it should be 2020. Correct. I even read it and didn't catch that. Um, so that's, as far as there, we'll change it. So in city council, March 19, 2020, instead of 2019. Thank you for noting that. Any other discussion on this order? Seeing and hearing none, all those in favor of a positive recommendation, please say aye. 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 Any objections? And no one's abstaining. Okay. Um, I don't have any new business for finance. Is there a motion to adjourn the finance committee? Move to adjourn. Second. And seconded. All those in favor of adjourning, please say aye. 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 Okay. We are now adjourned out of finance. And we are back in the council meeting and we're going to go through those financial orders that we just had in finance so the mm -hmm. first one is 20.023 in order for fy 2020 budget transfers move approval please second motion has been made by councillor dwight and seconded by councillor labarge um is there any further discussion on this order Hearing and seeing none. Laura, when you're ready, roll call, please. Councilor Foster. Yes. yes. Councilor Jarrett. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Maori. Oh, yes. Councilor Quinlan. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Thorpe. Yes. And Councillor Dwight. Yes. Okay, that passes in first reading. Um, the second order is 20.034 in order to appropriate free cash to public safety wireless project. Move approval, please. Second. It's been made and seconded. Any discussion on this? Hearing and seeing none, um, I'm going to ask for a roll call, and I'm going to note that there's been a request for two meetings, so we're going to do the first roll call. Councillor Jarrett? Yes. Councillor Labarge? Yes. Councillor Maori? Yes. Councillor Quinlan? Yes. Councillor Shara? Yes. Councillor Thorpe? Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. And Councillor Foster. Yes. Move to suspend rules, please. To allow for a second reading. Okay, so the motion second. by Councillor Dwight to suspend rules for a second reading. Where was the second? Councillor Jarrett. Second. Councillor Jarrett has seconded it. Um, any, uh, any discussion on um, the motion to suspend rules? All those in favor of spending rules, please say aye. 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 Move second reading, please. Second reading is moved by Councillor Dwight. Second. 
seconded by Councillor Foster. Foster. Um, any discussion on second reading? Hearing none, when you're ready, Laura, roll call, please. Councillor Labarge? Yes. Councillor Maori? Yes. Councillor Quinlan? Yes. Councillor Shara? Yes. Councillor Thorpe? Yes. Councillor Dwight? Yes. Councillor Foster? Oh, wait. There you are. That, that's Councilor, a yes. That was wait. an affirmative. Yes. No. And Councillor Jarrett? Yes. Okay. okay. That passes in both readings. Um, moving on. Next, uh, we go straight to ordinances. Um, I'm, I'm hearing some feedback, so I don't know if people need to mute or. Um, first ordinance and first reading is 19.173, an ordinance to allow change from one conforming use to another without a finding. This is a first reading. I'm going to. Um, and then uh, I'll ask for a motion and then we'll have session. Um, so I, I'm just trying to click on the right one. Laura, I want to click on the LM final, right? Well, um, the Legislative Matters oops, Committee had requested some language from the planning department for the first reading. I think they'd approved it with that request. So um, Carolyn has submitted some language in response, but that hasn't yet been accepted. So what was sent forward by LM is the version without her new um, suggested addition. So um, I guess I think the language that planning department is proposing is the LM final, um, that document. Proposed LM final, okay. Yes. Um, Okay, so I'm gonna read the uh, the other one, and we will discuss the. Hold on, guys, it's clunky. Um, is that? Okay, so I should read the first one. For the second one. Sorry, I'm lost. Um, the first one, well, I suppose maybe um, if you wanted to read the version with the amendments that the Legislative Matter Committee requested from the Planning Department, that would be the second one. Okay, um, okay I'll read that one. And it is. Um, Carolyn, I know you're here. Is it the red or the, your latest edits are the red or the blue? Um, the latest edits are, um, so if you're reading the 311 version, that has um, the blue edits, basically item number two, that second paragraph in blue okay. is what was changed. Okay, great, thank you, okay. So, uh, in the year 2019, upon the recommendation of Mayor David J. Narkowitz and Planning and Sustainability, an ordinance of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts, providing that the Code of Ordinances, City of Northampton, Massachusetts, be amended by changing Section 350-9.3, B1, and 2 to be consistent with other sections of 9.3. Be ordained by the City Council of the City of Northampton in City Council assembled as follows. Amend as shown. 359-9-3. Change extension or alteration of legally existing non-conforming structures, uses, or lots. Uh, legally pre-existing non-conforming structures, uses, or lots may be changed, extended, or altered as set forth below. Except as noted in section 
uh, subsection, subsection 350-9.2a above, if a use is not eligible under one subsection, proceed to the next subsection. B, a conforming use on a pre-existing non-conforming lot. A conforming use on such a lot may be changed, extended, or altered. One, as of right to the same conforming use in a conforming structure, which means all the dimensional and density provisions of the current zoning, except for adding the word the, um, and pre-existing non-conforming dimensional elements being added, taking out, uh, it's being struck that are pre-existing non-conforming such as lot size, frontage, or depth, and when the lot size, frontage, and depth requirements do not change. Um, so that sentence ends, ends with, except for the pre-existing non-conforming dimensional elements. Two, with a finding from the Zoning Board of Appeals when said change, extension, or alteration is to a different conforming use, which A, meets all the dimensional and density provisions of the current zoning except for the pre-existing non-conforming dimensional elements, and B, uh, when the change has been struck and says does not, uh, adding does not trigger a review under other sections of the zoning ordinance by any other board. When no other board is required to review, the project is, is um, removed and changed to proposed change, extension, or alteration, the zoning board shall make a finding as defined in 9.2b. And then the rest has been struck, which says, which requires the same or less minimum lot, minimum lot with frontage, minimum lot depth, setbacks, parking, that is required for the present use, and lot does not fully conform to the present zoning requirements for the proposed use, green number, subsequent sections based on the above. So that last um, sentence has been deleted. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to make a motion for the purposes of discussion to put it on the floor. Motion's been made by Councillor Dwight. I second. Seconded, Seconded. Seconded by Councillor Maori. Okay. Um, so, disc oh, discussion. I see Councillor Jarrett has his hand raised. Uh, Councillor Shara, would you, uh, before we get into this, explain the zoning process and the timelines that we're required to keep? Uh, and then also, um, if you could explain the charter objection and what that what that is and what that uh, process would be. Okay, can I, uh, may I defer to the city solicitor who's with us? Absolutely. <clears throat> this is not something that I anticipated. May I take a moment to look at it? I apologize, absolutely. Um, I'm talking about the charter objection. I'm sorry, say again? I'm talking about the charter objection. I'm sure that uh, if, if uh, with regard to the sort of nuts and bolts timeline of zoning, I'm sure Carolyn could help him with that while I take a look at the charter. Okay, turning to Carolyn. Sure. So um, under the Zoning Act, the um, the city council is required to take action on a vote of a proposed zoning amendment within 90 days of the close of public hearing. So councilors can, you know, take any amount of time. This just closed a week ago, um, but there, um, so there, you do have to work within that window of, of time, um, or else. You'd have to start the whole process over again if it's not if action is not taken within the 90 days. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll also note that um, within our own rules, that legislative matters when they act on something, um, when that committee acts on something, it needs to report to the full council within 30 days. Um, which means that we would have to, within 30 days, legislative matters would have to um, tell the full council what their, um, what the action that they took, any changes that they made and, and what it was, which has uh, 
by having it on the agenda in the session we're having now um, is accomplishing that. Um, I am looking for other. Madam, Madam Council President, it's uh, the city solicitor again. Yes, if please. I could ask Councillor Jarrett specifically, if he has a question about charter objection. I just wanted to make sure I understood it that, um, and you could tell me if that's, this is correct. So my understanding is any one counselor could raise a charter objection prior to when, prior to a vote being taken or at a vote. And it, that would move the item to the next council meeting. Whether regular or special. Right. That's true. Okay, you great. I just that. wanted to make sure basically that everyone uh, understood the, that they have that ability. Um, not that we'll necessarily do that, but um, just that, you know, we're always with that, even if we don't, if there isn't a motion to table or anything like that, any one of us can choose to delay. Uh, Councillor Dwight. Of course, those two come in conflict when you have the, as as uh, Councilor Jared asked, was that there's a clock that's ticking on one end. And so that in the event that we actually do post one, we would actually act, I think, have to convene a special council meeting in order to meet the clock. I'm not sure, I'm not sure where we are on dates or where the clock is. So it could possibly be suspended, but the fact is, is that um, it may be too far uh, suspension in order to qualify under the rules of ordinances being approved within a certain time frame, and that's my only concern. I mean, I think there are other mechanisms actually to um, defer a vote, um, and that's that's one of them. But I don't know if that would be necessary in this conversation. So, Councillor Dwight, um, wouldn't Carol and Mish know when the deadline would be on this? I'm. Maryland's um, yeah, you just, uh, I mean, the public hearing closed on March 9th. So that was a week and a half ago. So you um, have time within the, the 90 days to, um, you know, take a vote. Uh, obviously, the council would want to make, understand, you know, the reason for delaying the vote and, and what would be, um, what an appropriate date for continuing the conversation would be based on that um, interest in delay. Thank you. Councilor Mayori, did I see your hand up? Did you take it down? I thought I saw another hand. I took it down. I was looking for some clarification, but I think it's becoming clearer to me about, okay. the, about the process of this of the charter objection. Right. Um, I mean, I'll just say, so, you know, we heard that there's concern about having this discussion in this format. Um, and while I certainly acknowledge that, um, I, you know, I think that we have to be mindful of the fact that we're in a situation that uh, there's a lot of unknowns and we don't know how long um, we will be convening like this. So that's just something to be noted when we're talking about postponing to a, to a date um, there's, there are a lot of unknowns about how long, uh, this situation and convening in this way, um, will go on. You know, I think we did, um, we did, we were able to have public comment. I think we'll refine how that worked. Um, but, uh, we're always able to receive comment by email and, um, we're able to get public comment tonight. So, um, anyway. Uh, Councillor Foster. Oh, you're muted. I'm unmuting you. I'm trying to. I, I had muted myself, excuse me. Um, thank you for, for this discussion. And I just wanted to clarify as well. Um, I certainly wrestled with how I felt about moving forward with, with this discussion tonight. Um, and, and clarifying the timeline is very helpful but also any change would require two readings, am I correct? So if there was a vote taken tonight, then there would be another opportunity um, 
at the at the next meeting we have, correct? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I am looking. Ask Carolyn. Ask Carolyn a question. Yeah. So, uh, Carolyn, Councillor Thorpe would like to ask you a question. Sure. Uh, Ms. Carol, can you talk to me a little bit more about the width of finding from the Zoning Board of Appeals that was um, amended for uh, today's hearing? Can you just talk to uh, us a little bit about that? Sure. So there were um, three public hearings held on this particular ordinance, um, proposed ordinance amendment. The first was in front of Planning Board, then it went to legislative matters and it was continued to a second hearing at legislative matters. So that um, uh, made up the third um, discussion and, and hearing on that. And out of that third um, public hearing um, came a request from the counselors about adding a provision that does, um, it would alter the way the amendment was originally presented by requiring some kind of review for any change to um, from one conforming use to a new conforming use on a lot that doesn't meet the zoning requirements. Um, and that was it, based on a request and concern by the public that there be some level of review. So um, this added paragraph would then mean that any change from one use to a new use that's on a non-conforming lot would either go to the Zoning Board of Appeals for a permit review, or if it meets a certain threshold, it would go to the Planning Board um, instead. So that none of the, um, the previous uh, amendment uh, proposed showed that it would just, it could, there could be a situation where a project would go through without any review at all. So that's what this change um, would present. Thank you. Carolyn, I'd like to um, ask you a question in regards to frontage and so forth like this. Uh -huh. Okay, is this going to change the rule of frontage that we have in the city? No. So this um, amendment only deals with a small set, subset of properties in this in the city. Um, that don't comply with a certain element of lot size or frontage or depth. Um, it doesn't change the minimum requirement for those elements. It just allows for a property that predates the time and zoning when we had frontage, for example, as you raise, um, to allow lots to change over time from one use to another, even if they don't mm -hmm. meet standard for frontage, it doesn't take away what the minimum frontage requirements would be for any other parcel. It just allows mm -hmm. a lot in an existence for 20, 30, 50 years to be able to um, be modified to a new use, um, knowing that the lot isn't changing in and of itself, but it just still has this non-conforming element. Okay, so say as an example, grandfathering and so forth, which I've talked with you about grandfathering, right. people who are grandfathered and had to go through specific ways of how they could go ahead and form a lot and so forth like that on their properties. Now, what happens here? People who have gone through grandfathering and now we're going in and changing this. W what happens here with people who have been grandfathered and had to go through the legal process of doing that? So this um, subsection of the, the um, chapter that deals with grandfathered parcels just is um, addressing a, a small a uh, portion of the total number of lots that even are within that whole section that deals with grandfathering. So if someone already got approval to make a modification to their property by going mm -hmm. to the zoning board or having some other kind of review, this change doesn't affect that. This actually lifts, currently the ordinance doesn't allow a certain number of parcels to even be changed from one use to a new use. Um, okay. If that new use triggers a, a requirement to provide um, 
more parking or um, has more units or something like that, right now, no change could happen on that property to the new use. This modification okay. proposed would allow a path forward for those properties that are currently sort of stuck the way in the use that they have. I thank you very much, Caroline. Okay, sure. Um, okay, uh, Councillor Quinlan has been waiting patiently with his hand up. My arm is getting tired. Um, uh, well, the question that I had was, are there uh, properties out there that have applied for, uh, you know, a change to the zoning for their space if it was non-conforming that were denied that opportunity? And where do we stand with those people moving forward if they've been denied, but now we're going to make it much easier? Um, so there have been uh, project applicants who have come forward who um, cannot move forward because currently there's a prohibition on allowing a change. Uh, for example, if, if someone had a single family home and their um, lot frontage or depth didn't meet the minimum requirements that we currently um, require in zoning, then, um, and they wanted to add another unit right now, we're telling people, no, you can't do that. Or you can wait to see if a modification happens and then move forward. Um, so uh, at this point, there are, you know, one or two folks who are sort of waiting to see what happens. Um, um, otherwise, they won't be able to make a modification unless it changes. But hi hi historically speaking, are there people that have been told they couldn't, couldn't do this that now would be wondering why they were told no if it's so much easier? Um, sure. Um, historically, I mean, I can't, I don't know how, a number to give you, but they certainly could come back now. If this changes, they could certainly come back. It doesn't, just because um, the city said no in the past, doesn't bar them from trying again. It's just like with any zoning change, if something changes to allow um, a use or a lot that wasn't previously, previously allowed, then someone could move forward with a request. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, any other questions at this moment from counselors? Solicitor well, Seawald, are you ready for us to come back to you or is there anything else you have to say or any questions? The answer is the question. So, um, and then Carolyn answered the other question. So maybe you're off. The, <clears throat> the only thing I would say is that if you, uh, the only time that um, uh, an objection can be lodged to move this to the next meeting is tonight. Once it gets to the second reading, that can't happen. So if it's going to be continued at the second meeting, it'll have to be done by, by a specific motion to a date certain. Okay. Other than that, nothing, nothing to add. Okay, thank you. Uh, and unless there's somebody else, I'll go back on mute. Okay. <laughs> um, Councillor Jared, and then Councillor Dwight after Councillor Jared. Uh, are we waiting uh, to see if there's any more questions, or are all questions for staff done, or? Um, okay, uh, I could. I'm happy to to speak. I just wanted to make sure that the questions had been answered. Um, um, I don't. You know, I think if people have more questions after you speak, that that's fine. Um, um, but if you want to speak now. Yeah. Okay, great. So um, I do have concern about taking this up tonight, and some of that comes from you know the the public comment that we received, um, but really. It has to do with this kind of unprecedented change in uh, our lives in the past week. And that that means that there are prob there are people who have not had the opportunity to really um, co come to terms or think about or or are perhaps not coming to meetings or rather, you know, coming online to meetings um, who who would. And so 
I am in favor of moving this to the April 2nd meeting and then we would have our first reading then um, and then on the second reading on the April 16th meeting, which would be still a month and a half uh, before the deadline. Another reason uh, specifically to wait tonight has to do with Councillor Nash. Back in February, Councillor Nash spoke at the uh, Legislative Matters hearing when it first began and had a number of concerns. Um, and then he became sick uh, around March 6th, I believe, and was not able to come to the March 9th uh, Legislative Matters hearing. Um, so given the, so I, I have concerns about, I would like uh, him to be able to uh, heal and be able to speak uh, at, the, at our next meeting. So um, I guess that, the, in, that that would be a motion to table to the April 2nd meeting. Um, I, I think uh, the motion would actually be to postpone, not table would be the right term. Okay. Right mm -hmm. Sorry. Uh, okay. It's, I've learned table, we use tabling sort of in the vernacular, but that's, um, it uh, does a whole nother thing. Um, okay. So that, um, um, that motion has been made to postpone to April. What was the date again? Councillor Dwight. April 2nd. Um, that's been made. Councillor Dwight. Um, but before there's a second made, I just want to say that if we do postpone it at this point, there's no further discussion of the items. And there will be, uh, and, and one of the things that concerns me, and this came up uh, in public comment, and it's also come up in letters that we've all received, and it, is that, uh, and, and from counselors, when we continue the hearing at, at Legislative Matters, there's an opportunity to learn more about this proposed ordinance and, and in the hope of getting some more information, if, I, I wa <laughs> if, if there are any questions now, let's hear them. If there are any concerns beyond the concerns that have already been stated, is there any new information then I think it's worth hearing before we go to a motion to postpone. Um, okay. Once we I postpone withdraw, it, then I second that, Dwight. Well, I'm, I withdraw my motion. Okay, All right. thank you, Alex. This time. Withdrawn. Thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, Councillor Dwight, you had raised your hand before that comment you just made. So, is there um, an additional comment you'd like to make? Only insofar as, and, and Councilor Jarrett already acknowledged it, and in fact, actually, it's worth noting that we have uh, I mean, five or six or maybe more letters uh, relative to this specific ordinance, um, speaking in opposition or at least, at the very least, requesting that we postpone or delay uh, um, for the, actually, one of the reasons it's reiterated in every single one of them is that there's concern that there are constituents who are not tech savvy enough to access this meeting and this conversation. I think that's a valid point. Um, I also think, you know, we are, we've all acknowledged that we're dealing with extraordinary times. And I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm fine with uh, delaying this. I am, but, you know, as I said in legislative matters, I am not opposed to this proposed uh, ordinance change. Um, and I and I and you know I I plan on unless hearing different information. I've not heard any new information. If I hear new information that may actually impact and affect my vote, but I would I would ask particularly uh, Attorney John McLaughlin, who's written us a number of letters, basically reiterating his argument over and over again, which which is fine. I understand his points, and maybe he's concerned that we don't understand them. But the fact is, I, we, I, for me, to persuade me, I need more information that has not been presented, new information that would um, cause me to reconsider my, uh, my intent to vote yes on this. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I'm looking for hands for 
Can I make a comment? Yes, please. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. So we had a hearing on this matter. And at that time, I was grappling with the this issue. And at that time, I actually asked for a, I actually used the word table and um, was corrected on that and asked to have it continued for a second hearing. Um, we had that second hearing. And at that time, we had um, heard from Carolyn, we heard from um, members of the public. Um, when this proposal was first presented to me uh, or to us, the idea of the whole with the finding was was actually to be removed altogether. Um, after the second hearing, there was a proposal to keep the finding uh, but with amendments. In that meantime, in the meantime, I've heard from constituents um, against us moving forward. I've heard from constituents in favor of uh, this proposal. I've heard from people who were um, happy to have the whole finding removed. I've heard from constituents that wanted to keep the finding, but to have it amended. Um, so it's not an easy um, 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 subject, but I want to make sure all the counselors knew that how far we've come along on this. And um, it's, uh, you know, I'm ready. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I would like to speak, Councilor Labarge. Um, I have to agree what I just heard. I think um, there's been a lot of input and output and with legislative matters, having the two hearings and also the amendments that have been put in place. So um, I, I support this and no matter what, if it comes up again and we hold it back, I will support this. Okay, thank you, Councillor LaForge. Other comments or, oh, Councillor Quinlan. Uh, just make sure I'm, oh, I thought I was muted. Okay, uh, you know, I, um, I, I, I understand the reasons for moving forward this. I, I think, um, you know, we, we have heard, you know, there has been a, a number of public hearings. I, I understand that. Uh, completely uh, tabling this or, or postponing this so that we can, you know, engage the community further uh, is something that that I would support. But at the same time, uh, you know, similarly to what has been said, I understand we've, we've done quite a bit of work on this already. Um, you know, I'm going to just tell you that, you know, I'm not uh, really torn about this. I, I have disagreed with this from the first time I've kind of read about it and understood a lot of it. Um, I like Councillor Thorpe. Uh, I've done a lot of outreach to ask questions and try to understand this. Um, you know, a lot of the opponents are not saying don't change the ordinance. A lot of the opponents are saying uh, change the ordinance, uh, but in a more thoughtful manner. And I know that there's been some amendments here, um, you know, but but plain and simple, I think as a, you know, a person that, that uh, you know, doesn't feel that deregulation is necessarily a great thing, um, I don't think that it's a great idea to make it easier uh, for people that want to do business in our city to, um, you know, basically not have to request uh, as much permission, um, you know, to, to go along with what, what the city zoning laws are. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not there. I'm not there. So uh, I thank you very much for, for hearing me out. Um, and uh, I understand again, why we're, why we're moving forward here. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Quinlan. Any further discussion? Any other questions for uh, Carolyn? Um, I see, okay, I've got Councillor Jarrett and then I've got Councillor Dwight. Councillor Jarrett? Um, yes, thank you. So uh, I wanted to explain some of my thinking about this. Um, first, I want to say that you know we have an affordability crisis here in Northampton, in the state, and in the nation. Uh, Massachusetts is the most expensive state for housing, with four hundred thousand dollars being the average single-family home. Of course, it's less here, um, and there are the issues of supply and demand. Um, that you know, if we can increase the supply of housing 
that that will have an effect on, on lowering the prices. Um, some have noted that there are more vacancies and that it's harder to fill, uh, you know, rental housing, for example. Um, and to me, I think that this is likely because rents have risen as high as they can and actually need to come down and that that would be the, the natural progression. Um, so, and I would like to say that we also, I think we need more housing at all income levels that there's, there is demand for. And, um, you know, of course we need more affordable housing and um, there's really not enough of that. Um, the, but more expensive properties are needed as well because they actually reduce the pressure on less expensive properties. So for example, we have contractors who are buying the few inexpensive properties out there and they're usually properties that need a lot of work. Um, they buy them mostly for cash and then improve them and then are selling them for quite a markup. So having those more expensive properties uh, on the, there on the market um, will free up the less expensive homes for people who are able to, uh, to, you know, who don't have as much and would like to put in that sweat equity into, into, in, in that example. Um, so the, there's also the question of um, how we're developing and so the, and infrastructure. So we know that um, many of the properties that will be affected by this ordinance change will be properties that are in uh, the historic uh, neighborhoods or rather the places where the lots were laid out before the zoning was um, established, before modern zoning was established. Um, and so those areas tend to be closer together um, and our infrastructure is better in terms of um, the, you know, the water and the sewer. And these are all the reasons in general for, for infill development. Um, but that brings value to the city and um, therefore brings, you know, as far as our tax base is concerned and our tax bills, um, it's better to develop in that way. Um, so. Speaking to some of the concerns, um, I would think, uh, you know, there's the example of as we increase the development in town, um, that we see a more, we're seeing a loss of trees and tree cover and our urban tree canopy. Um, and so this is, you know, I think we need to expand our significant tree ordinance and really think more carefully about trees, but that's not exact, you know, I don't think that's a reason to hold up this ordinance. Um, I think that we need to work, you know, I, I don't think that there will be a sudden expansion of uh, development because of this ordinance. Um, but I think we need to be moving forward on other, other angles. Um, thinking about traffic and parking concerns, um, <clears throat> there is the, in, in terms of when you um, build roads, there's the concept of induced demand. And that's the idea that the more um, roads that you, when you widen the road or when you um, build, build more roads you know, to, to get to a place that you have, uh, for a while you've solved the problem. And you know, you're doing that because of congestion. Uh, because there is too much traffic, and so you want to you build you widen the road, and for a while um, you get some relief from that. But what happens is that people tend to change uh, their their habits and actually choose to drive more on those roads instead of reducing trips or going going somewhere else until you get to a point where there are roads that the roads tend to fill up to the same level of congestion uh, as before. So thinking about this um, in terms of parking, when you have a standard that has a higher parking uh, requirement. So for example, you have, you know, if you have two cars per apartment are required, there is more of an incentive to have more cars. Um, and if you have a one car per apartment or per, you know, I, I'm not getting the exact details right here, but if you have that, then um, you have to think about, there's not, it's not quite as easy to have that second car. Now, you know, 
so the um, the concerns. So just in thinking about that, in terms of why we should build more, have more parking uh, in place, and um, so so I'm I would be I'm concerned to to require more parking um, because of that that factor. Um, folks have talked also about the issue of um, not being able to find parking in town and uh, the uh, lack of good public transportation, which I certainly agree with. Uh, however, there is quite a bit of public transportation that actually can serve many people who are not currently using it. And so, for example, um, the you know we we have service to East Hampton, to Holyoke, to uh, Hadley, Amherst, and Florence. That is um, that you know there 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 is decent service to that. Um, however, and we don't. It's not going to make sense for everyone to be able to take that service, but. Um, when there is that that push and having having you know not having to have two cars, um, not requiring two cars can actually give that push towards um, the uh, toward moving some folks toward public transportation use. Um, so the those are just some thoughts I have on the the traffic and parking um, arguments. The um, and it sounds like to me, sort of speaking more generally, the, the problem that a lot of people have is with the planning board special permit process. And I wonder if we need to look at that process. In the example of Dewey Court, um, that process has not yet been completed. And there are, the seven, there are seven different criteria that have to be met in order for that, the, you know, the special permit to be issued. Um, and there's certainly, from what I'm hearing from the Dewey Court specific situation, um, which this ordinance would affect, is that there, there are very valid reasons that it would not meet the special permit criteria. And if the planning board were to approve that, um, there still would be the recourse of legal action um, to make sure that they are doing a good job in, in that. Um, so, the so what I come down to is that you know I hear a lot of the concerns um, about the about this this issue, but I believe we have some democratically put in place policies uh, that keep our that have our um, our permit process uh, is that make our permit process a good one. And that this ordinance in particular um, is, is does not go around any of those processes. Uh, it still <clears throat> requires that, that that people abide by that those. Um, so I I am feeling in favor of this this ordinance change, but would like to see the you know uh, additionally uh, <clears throat> not not holding this back, but additionally, uh, looking at our planning board special permit process again and looking at our significant tree ordinance. Okay, thank you. Councillor Dwight. Um, I'm very grateful for Councillor Jarrett laying out my case in a much more articulate and knowledgeable fashion than I was capable of mustering. So uh, that's one. Um, it, as it's been noted, we're living in an extraordinary time under extraordinary circumstances. In fact, there's probably going to be a massive recalibration about development, populations changing and moving. Um, you know, I think, as Councilor Jarrett pointed out, we've, we've literally peaked out on rental rates. I think actually one thing that I would like to do is to lobby in the event of a realized mortgage relief that's being promised to be extended to uh, that uh, we encourage or require i don't know if we have the authority uh, landlords to reduce the rents of their tenants because if their mortgages are consequently reduced that's not a final correction of the of something that's clearly problematic and 
my principal investment, as it were, of of of, of, an, of a yay vote for this is as Council Jarrett lays out that we have. I mean, Northampton's affordability is not dictated by the taxes and it's not dictated by the water rates or anything else. Our affordability is dictated by the desirability. It is the uh, people desire to move to this community. Well, that was right up until the point where no one can move now anyway, but that, and that desirability created a market on a system that actually has very limited means to expand its inventory on housing. And as Council Jarrett very rightly points out, consequently what happens is that uh, what were once affordable properties is being bought up and reconverted or, or likely now we'll see more teardowns if this were to continue as a trend. And those, those more affordable units have become less so and we start become a wealthier, wealthier community with no room for anybody else. And, you know, that's, I think, I think if I do if I do a little census in my head, I think that's a concern of every single counselor on this on this committee. Creating infill actually does have value. I remember there, there was considerable resistance, for instance, when we were changing the zoning to allow for ADUs or auxiliary dwelling units or mother-in-law apartments, uh, uh, promoting that development in, in the infill areas closer to the uh, downtown centers of Florence and Northampton. And the resistance was the concern about the impacts, the, the dilatory impacts that would have on the neighborhoods. And the neighborhoods would change. It's true. If, if, if what was predicted at the time that there was going to be a massive glut of development of ADUs and uh, there would be a significant, at least silhouette profile and a higher concentration profile in those neighborhoods. That didn't come to pass, even with the demand that we're describing. Part, and I understand the urgency, and I am sympathetic to the urgency of the one particular neighborhood that's actually lobbied against this directly because of their immediate concern of a, of a pending um, development proposal, which has since been withdrawn. And, and let's face it, I think if we're being realistic, given the the fact that the stock market is flatlined. Well, I wish it flatlined. Actually, it's plummeting. There's not a real likelihood of uh, of a developer coming in anytime soon and considering a large scale project that would put them at substantial risk at this point. I realize that's cold comfort and that's not a law, but I would I would that would be my suggestion to the neighborhood to count on that on some level. Also, I agree with Councilor Jarrett. Count on the process. See the process through. The developer pulled, withdrew uh, his proposal with prejudice, without prejudice, I'm sorry. And the, we don't know what his intentions are. But I, as I said, you know, it makes it difficult when there's a particular, one particular project that's being considered as we try to consider, as we're debating and deliberating a more holistic rule and law that's not specific to a particular project, although in in many cases a particular project does come to the forefront. I think, you know, I have yet to, as I said before, I have yet to hear any new information in opposition. I do understand, and I've heard the complaint about the parking pressures. I won't discount them or shrug them off, but the fact is, is that um, I think what has been described, the same, we had the same dread fear when uh, the Village Hill is being developed. Same thing when the lumber yard was being developed. Um, and and it's that there wouldn't be enough parking inventory to, to uh, the city would be overrun and no one would be able to find a parking space. I don't think, I, I, I agree with Councilor Jared. I think essentially, you know, if you, if you take the no impact at all to the cataclysmic impact that's being projected, it's actually somewhere in between those things. And as people adjust and adapt, and it should be noted that the streets are municipal public streets. They're not held by the people in the neighborhood. If you pay an excise tax, you have the right to park there. 
it's a public street. If you're if it's within a legal space, you're not blocking someone's driveway. You have the right to park there for a minimum of a maximum of seventy two hours. Um, so, I, you know, the other concern oh that this comes up in this and comes up and will come up in uh, another discussion is the issue of property values. The adverse impact of property values, how someone's property becomes devalued by the development, the, any development that occurs near it. Um, that has never been shown to be the case. Uh, it, it, as far as I know, in Northampton, there hasn't been a single development or project that's actually adversely impacted the property values. And if anything, it remained neutral or went up. And it's, it's, I, I think that when people are resistant to a project specific, particularly if it's going to transform or in their opinion, transmogrify their neighborhood, um, that viscerally the resistance is understandable. We all do it, we don't like it. We wouldn't like to have our landscape change, but the landscape that we don't control which is why we do have zoning actually to somewhat limit and mitigate. I believe the Councilor Jared is correct. I think there are a number of other uh, uh, criteria that are being, that would have been considered in the planning board had this project continue to go forward, that it wouldn't be able to hop over the fence. It would actually, there would be modifications. It would not in all likelihood stop the project by the planning board review. And I think that's the driving concern of the people in the Dewey Court neighborhood. They would like to see it stopped. And I think as far as our discussion on this point, they would like to see this stopped as well. I don't think they want this to go forward. I think they want it to end here. Um, and and I, I, while I understand the request, I don't, I respectfully disagree with, with it, so. Okay, thank you, Councillor Dwight. Other counselors, anyone have further questions for Carolyn Mish? Yes. Oh, oh okay. Um, I see Councilor Mayori and then Councilor Thorpe. Okay, Councilor Mayori first, please. Oops, you're muted. Yep. It took me a minute to get to it. Um, yes. Um, I just wanted to share my thoughts, having looked at this through legislative matters, uh, and also first maybe validate that I think we're doing a great job here tonight, and I think no one's claiming it's the same thing as having a physical space with you know physical uh, physical public there. Um, and frankly, if I thought this was a one-time deal, I would be viewing it differently. But um, as it's been stated, we don't really know what the future holds at this point. <clears throat> um, and I've really struggled with this one because what I'm hearing are kind of two things. What I'm seeing is a, uh, an ordinance that really, uh, the more I looked at it, the more incongruent it seems um, that it needs to be changed in my mind. And then, so then it becomes, what is the change? But, uh, what I'm also hearing from residents um, of some very reasonable concerns. And I, I think they've actually gone beyond just the kind of normal concerns of something is changing. I've heard some um, some real concerns about um, th that road and traffic and trees and parking and really looking at the um, Northampton, sustainable Northampton plan and the languaging there um, about um, not um, having significantly detrimental um, new infill and what that really means. Um, and uh, so while I want to just look at the zoning ordinance, I'd, I also want to, it would be disingenuous to not acknowledge the, the real impact um, that those residents were are afraid it, they will have. Uh, so I had a, at the end of legislative matters, I, um, I gave a neutral recommendation. And the reason I did that was um, really to spark this conversation, to uh, look at this, um, because what we were hearing um, was um, a few additional amend amendments that could be added to this, the, the original amendment 
um, to add that regulation. And um, Councillor Thorpe had made a, um, a suggestion, which I think is a sound one. I but I did want to kind of bring it to the full council and look at it together. And that's why I gave it a neutral um, recommendation at the time. And also I was hoping uh, to see Councillor Nash, who I believe couldn't make that meeting as well um, because he is the um, direct voice of those residents, um, but that's not there. So I, um, uh, one of my concerns was, um, If we're looking for, I agree with um, Councillor Quinlan about not taking away all regulation on this, but then what, what really becomes kind of something that, that we can live with. And I was hearing um, from uh, Solicitor Seawald that the, the, the findings process was actually not, maybe the, was less rigorous than the special permit process. And so I kind of wanted to unpack that a little bit. Um, but um, ideally, I, I really think that this process should be, and the voice and concern, reasonable concerns of residents should be caught by the embedded in the kind of planning board uh, process. The planning board, hope, you know, they're the ones um, who have the focus on this and experience. And I would like to see um, perhaps uh, Councillor Jarrett has proposed kind of looking at that. and. Um, in the future, I think I'll be more involved in really looking at that process to see where, before it gets to council, you know, where we can kind of um, make sure that the, pro the, the process is vetted uh, properly for residents. Um, that said, I, um, you know, I'm, I tend to want to um, pick one of these doors that we discussed at Legislative Matters and Council Thorpe has, and, and um, Carolyn have proposed one um, to kind of, to bring some regulation to this. I'm not sure it's perfect. I think ideally, as I said, this, this process before it ever gets to council or le legislative matters would be a, a, the place to really um, to catch um, um, prod to, to catch regulations that might kind of have a, overall negative impact on, on a, a, a neighborhood. Um, so um, I guess what I would be looking for bef um, is, I guess a, I'll end with a question for Carolyn, which is we had talked about uh, um, the door, you know, the different um, paths we could take in terms of adding to this amendment. Um, and, and, you can, and so you were talking about, the, so we talking about the findings adding a, um, if you would just say a word about why you chose that as opposed to, and I, I actually want to say that I've heard, and this is, it's been a while, so it's been a long process from concerned residents, a resident who owns property on, um, in an area that would be impacted, um, that they, that they might be open to the idea of taking this, um, ordinance and adding an amendment that they weren't just about blanketly not changing, um, the ordinance. And so I I, I want to hear yeah Carolyn if you could just um, especially for for the counselors that were not at the legislative matters meeting just just briefly go over that a little bit um, that I think sure. that would be helpful well, Carolyn before you start also could you um, I, I don't want to get us a, at all for a field of this actual ordinance that we're discussing right now but um, maybe just take a a moment to talk about. Um, the planning board and uh, you know what we don't control. Sure. So there are a number of um, um, elements or requirements in the zoning ordinance that um, are under the jurisdiction of the planning board. So if if an applicant is proposing a project that reaches reaches a certain threshold, automatically that always goes to the planning board. So if there's a construction project that's of 2,000 square feet or more that's not a single family home. So anything more than a single family home um, um, that's 2,000 square feet of new construction automatically gets put to the planning board and there are specific requirements that the planning board reviews within the zoning ordinance to address um, potential 
um, impacts and ways to mitigate those impacts. And those are all defined in the zoning ordinance. There are other thresholds for development projects that also trigger planning board review. Sometimes it's a special permit. And then when it's a special permit, that's that requires a super majority of approval by the planning board. And in some instances, there are many more specific requirements that um, are triggered under that review. Um, so planning board is um, mostly tasked with looking at development projects. And um, within the zoning, not only under special permit, there are many um, elements that are um, triggered that addresses, Councilor Jarrett suggested, there's uh, tree replacement and tree protection requirements. There are um, traffic mitigation requirements. Um, there are some modest sort of design requirements that are also triggered that all um, come into play within the planning board's jurisdiction. So none of that is being proposed to be changed. Those would all still be on the table. And sometimes there are projects that because of their nature, they're also um, need review by the zoning board. Those are um, projects or parcels or uses that um, for the most part relate to non-conforming uses or lots on a property. And so those are the kinds of things that go to the zoning board for very sort of um, defined and discrete um, review. And so there are instances that do where, where someone not only needs a zoning board review, but they also need a planning board review. Sometimes it's just zoning board and the zoning board just looks at a very specific issue. Um, and so where we are now is looking at this subset of chapter 9.3, which um, deals only with a situation in which you have a lot that was created before 1975 for the most part, um, you know, could be, 30 years old could be 100 years old, but there's a proposed change on the parcel to an allowed use, but it just happens that that parcel does not meet the current standards for what we would require for a brand new lot that's created today in 2020. Um, so the way it stands now, typically someone would go to the zoning board to get relief because they have this situation that was created um, not due to something they did, but just the fact that this parcel was created years ago. Um, and so in the scenario that's in front of the counselors, um, it initially, as I mentioned before, there was a present, there was a proposal that said, well, if a use is non-conforming and there's a proposal to go to another use, but it meets all the other elements in the zoning, it, it can meet setbacks and heights and, and layout. It might even trigger a different review by the planning board um, under which the planning board has jurisdiction anyway, um, that these uses should be allowed to go forward by right because there's another review process, another public hearing that would be triggered. And that public hearing automatically triggers notice to the abutters, um, advertising in the Gazette, and then notice on the street that something is um, there's a public hearing being held for a specific project. So all of that stands today, um, but the proposal, Councilor Maori had talked about how it had changed and what the different options were for instead of allowing something to go by right without going to the zoning board and just either going with no other permit review or if there's another piece of the project that would be, would trigger a planning board review, it would just be, put on that path to the planning board. Um, so the in, the in between um, that's in front of you that was modified since the legislative matters meeting is that if a project doesn't need a planning board review, but it's a change of use, it would still go to the zoning board under um, what we call finding. And most permits that are going to the zoning board are what we call findings and the board needs to find that the change is not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing conditions on the property or the existing use in that neighborhood. Um, and the board goes through that analysis. The zoning board does have some special permit um, review, but it's not typically for non-conforming situations. They do 
special permit granting, they have special permit granting authority for um, signs, for example. So if someone wants to put a bigger sign than what's normally allowed on a property, that's a special permit. Um, the other options with this ordinance that I had laid out for council is that you could alternatively to um, creating that binding path to the zoning board would be to um, up to a certain threshold, um, make sure that all projects get some kind of public hearing review, whether it's a zoning board finding or planning board. Um, and that's what's in front of you now. The other step would be, you know, ratchet it up to no matter, it, um, even if the project needs planning board review up to another threshold, it could still go to the zoning board and to the planning board up to a site plan review planning board. Um, but then you get into the issues of overlapping jurisdiction. The zoning board is still gonna rely on the same zoning ordinance that dictates tree replacement or tree protection or traffic mitigation, the planning board reviews. So it becomes um, a little bit um, of an overlapping permit review when you send it to both boards. Um, and so that would be another path, but it's just a little bit um, duplicative, I would say. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Maori. Like, right. I, just, I think, I'm sorry, hold on one sec. Councillor Thorpe, you wanted to speak, right? Oh. Carolyn, Carolyn answered it, I think, and it's this change, this with the finding, with the amendment does not impact the tree ordinance, correct? Right. No matter what, that mm -hmm. still stays in place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, uh, Councillor Maori. Oh yeah, I just wanted to clarify that I wasn't implying that we could control the planning board at all. I was kind of saying the opposite. I was trying to say that um, um, that I would like to, you know, personally look at that process um, for in the future, so that I um, I see how these um, vet the vetting process really works. So that's what the, my comment about kind of. Um, that was. But really, I wanted to thank Carolyn again. She's gone over this many times, and um, that was really helpful. Um, and, yeah, so thanks, sure. Carolyn. Sure. Thank you. Um, Councilor Dwight, did you raise your hand before? I thought I saw something new. You're muted. I'm mute now. Um, no, I didn't. I don't think I have my hand up, but I. I here, let's pretend I had it up for a second. I, I just, um, I think one of the questions that I wanted to ask the solicitor was, um, you know, the, there's been a suggestion that, um, well, there's been an expression of a lack of faith in the various institutions that we have here to protect and defend a neighborhood, uh, the planning board, the council, the process by which we've done this, hearings or most of the complaints in the letters were essentially the expressing outrage with one our ineptitude or lack of understanding or our process or the lack of notification among other things but I, I want if the solicitor could just outline briefly what the process would be that someone would oppose a project that's being proposed proximate to their house if they were in a butter and a qualified <coughs> complainer what is that process that would um, that they would be able to go through, and maybe even realize uh, um, a, a, a cessation of the project? Well, I mean, there are several processes, or at least two processes, that um, attach to uh, land use hearings. First, there is the hearing itself, which um, must be accorded all due process meaning there has to be adequate notice, a right to be heard uh, by, a, by an impartial decision maker. Um, and so there are very specific standards that the board has to apply to the project. And um, the state legislature decided many years ago, 1975, um, that we're going to leave, the, we're gonna have local boards uh, with membership of lay people, local community um, 
residents who are going to apply their discretion as to these standards. And so that's the process. We have uh, you know, community members who are appointed to these boards, uh, affirmed by, or, uh, by the council, and um, they hear uh, evidence, they take the evidence, and they apply it to the standards that are in the ordinance, and they make a decision. Um, in every case, or in almost every case, somebody's unhappy, and that's just you know the way zoning works. Um, if they're unhappy and they think that the board has made an erroneous decision, we have courts, either the land court uh, in Boston or the superior court here in Hampshire County, who will hear and, um, and review that decision to make sure that the board um, wasn't arbitrary and capricious and applied the right standards. Um, but that's the process that the legislature has provided for us. Our, our uh, standards for special permits are typical standards for special permits. And um, so that's the process. If there are other questions, I'll be happy to address them. Wait, um, and while I still have the floor, is, is what is the legal definition of detriment in this context? Well, I mean, detriment comes in many forms, and the way you determine whether there's detriment is to look at the uh, ordinance and to determine what uh, uh, what interests are being protected by the ordinance. Um, overcrowding, parking, noise. I mean, there are usually in in um, land use laws some standards that apply to certain conduct that can be deemed detrimental. Uh, in order to appeal, they're going to have to show that they are actually they have actually been caused some detriment, and um, other than um, just not wanting the pro the project next to him or her. But um, so uh, it really is based on what the ordinance itself protects in terms of detriment. Thank you. Other questions or comments. Okay, I am Councilor LaBarge. I'm just checking in with you. I'm here. Good. Um, okay, if there is no further discussion, no further questions for uh, the solicitor or for Carolyn, oh, Councilor Dwight. Okay, there we go. Uh, Councilor Jarrett did actually have a request, I mean, and it was courteous enough to postpone. He was courteous enough to postpone that postponement, or at least that discussion, to allow for a more expansive conversation. So I would defer to Councilor Jarrett if he's still interested in um, pursuing that. Um, well. I would love to hear from councillors who haven't spoken if they would like to weigh in at all on this issue, uh, Councillor Foster, Councillor Shara. Um, and um, and I do think I, I would like, I w I'm not making it right now because I still would love to hear more, uh, but I will be putting forward a motion to table. I'm uh, not table, postpone, sorry. Okay. Other counselors who want to speak? Oops, sorry, I thought. Councilor Foster, I can't tell. Oh, I couldn't tell if you were frozen. <laughs> okay, Councilor Foster. I was freezing while trying to decide. Uh, can you see me okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. I'm getting a message that my connection's unstable. Um, Councilor Jarrett, thank you for. Um, specifically inviting me to come in. Oh, you are frozen. And it's true that, um, okay, still frozen? No, but. Uh, okay, I'll try again. Um, try again, yeah. Okay, uh, what I have to say is quick, that this discussion has been very helpful and um, I feel as though I have enough information um, uh, and, and understand that the public process has been quite extensive and I actually do feel good about moving forward. Okay, thank you. Um, 
Uh, since I was also asked, I will I will weigh in as well and say uh, very similar to Councilor Foster. Um, you know, I have um, I was I sit on legislative matters and um, ask questions there. And uh, while I I understand people's concerns, um, both in general about this zoning change, but in particular about this moment in time for having this discussion, as I said, sort of as the beginning to sort of frame the discussion, um, uh, there's been a lot of opportunity for public input. Um, and we um, received a lot of, we received um, public comment via email today. Um, and there were people that also were able to comment um, here with us tonight. So I don't, uh, like Councillor Dwight had said previously, I don't feel that any new questions have been raised um, or there are any sort of new um, issues to explore. So um, I had uh, voted to move it forward with a positive recommendation at Legislative Matters um, and feel comfortable um, voting this evening, but you know, I will go back to Councilor Jarrett, and um, I, I want us, of course, to be mindful of this timeline that's been laid out for us. Um, and within those parameters, um, you know, we could see what the council's pleasure is, but I'm comfortable moving forward. So I've spoken now. Um, Councilor Jarrett, I'm going to throw it back to you. Okay, well, I will make the motion to postpone to April 2nd. That motion to postpone to April 2nd has been made by Councillor Jarrett. I will second it. And seconded by Councillor Dwight. Discussion on the motion, Councillor Dwight. Um, I'm fine with the postponement, although it's as, as it's been noted that um, we do have, as I think Councilor Foster pointed out, that we have the opportunity to actually have a discussion further on because there's two readings, which allows for more information and more input. What specifically actually speaks to me to this motion is Councilor Jarrett's point about the absence of Councilor Nash. Um, uh, he has not had an opportunity um, to weigh in on this beyond actually he did he did speak briefly well not so briefly but who am i to say um at at legislative matters i think was yeah and or he shared with us the his his some of his concerns about the impacts on the neighborhood I, and to be perfectly honest, I couldn't really divine what it was that he was, what he was arguing or arguing for or against or or neutral. I'm not sure. I would like to hear from. Um, I hope he is recovered in time. The postponement would allow us to hear from him, and would make the clock narrower and tighter, and the decision more um, urgent as it were, based on the criteria that we, or the rules that we have in place under the charter. So, or actually under the state law. So, uh, I mean, there are two options. There's this postponement, or we could um, do it in two readings and hope that he's recovered enough that he could show up for this, uh, be available for the second meeting, although Lord knows which one of us might be picked off next, so we don't know. And you know these are the times and the circumstances we're living with so that um that's the only thing that makes me a little nervous about postponement is, is there's so many variables and so many uh pressures that are larger than the issues that we're talking about but anyway so that's a long second and a long debate for that so i'll leave it at that um, any other discussion? And this is just to this post, this motion to postpone. Councilor Foster. You're muted. Oh. Hold up. All right. Thanks. Um, just a quick clarification. Uh, you froze again. If we do. Uh, 
Let me, if we do postpone, I'm going to comment my, I'm going to type you a message. Okay. I can, we can hear you right now. Oh, oh okay. So if we do postpone to the next meeting yep. and Councillor Nash were unable to be present to speak to the issues, could we lost We got to, if Councillor Nash were take a motion to postpone. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. You are. Hang on. Uh, okay. I'm typing you a message. Okay. While Councillor Foster is typing that message, <laughs> Is there, is there another counselor who'd like to speak to this motion to postpone? Yes, Councillor Shara, I'd like to speak on this. Great. I mean, even even if we do a postponement on this, if we did the first reading, you still have the two weeks to be able to get information that other counselors and what or what are they asking for on it, and especially like Councillor Nash. I mean, he could also email of, you know, his concerns and so forth like that. To me, we're postponing it and doing two readings. Well, we're doing a first reading and we have two more weeks. So within that period of two weeks, we can go ahead and still get information. That's, that's my feelings. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so this is, I'm going to read uh, Councillor Foster's um, message that she sent. If we moved forward tonight and Councillor Nash were unable to be present at the next meeting, could we then vote to postpone so we could get his input firsthand? So the question is, if we were to postpone, uh, would we be able to postpone? and he weren't able to be there, as I just read, um, would we have time in um, on this clock to postpone again? Uh, mm -hmm. Councillor Dwight, did you do the math? Uh, yeah, I, I believe it's virtually the same thing if we postpone now or postpone on after the first reading. The math comes out the same. We would still... Um, you know, we could postpone after uh, uh, the second reading. It's just deferring to the next meeting. So in any event, yes. it, the worst case scenario has it going out into the first meeting in April. I mean, I'm sorry, the second meeting in April. Second. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. that, that logically makes sense. Um, uh, Councillor Quinlan has his hand up. I did do I did do the math, and it's June June seventh is the ninetieth day from March 9th. So it's a I mean it's a long ways from now still. June seventh is the ninety day mark. Got it. Okay. Okay. Councilor Darren. Oh, okay, I'm not sure if you can see when I actually raise a hand or if I have to do it in the other way. It's actually easier um, to see it when you actually raise it. Yeah. Um, so the math for this in terms of votes, um, my understanding is, so this is a two-thirds vote, um, and regardless of absences, it still must get seven positive uh, votes. Is that correct? Um because I believe that's what the rules or the charter, I forget which, um, state that, you know, even if we, it's not going to be two thirds of eight tonight, it is still seven. If more than one person votes against it, it does not pass. I, I see the solicitor shaking his head. Six. It's two thirds of nine. Oh, okay. Which is six, not seven. Six, right. yes. Got it. I guess good, good point on a zoning change. It requires a two thirds vote. Um, okay, so we are still discussing the motion to postpone. Uh, Councilor Dwight. To Council Jarrett's point, if this were to fail in first reading by the two the the two thirds majority, then that's it, and it's done. 
It doesn't, it will, we won't have a second reading. There won't be a postponement. We won't get to hear from Councilor Nash. So that's worth noting. Noted. Okay. Any further discussion on postponing till April 2nd? Yes, yes, April 2nd. Seeing none, how would, uh, shall we do, let's do a roll call on the motion to postpone. Laura's muted. What's that? Oh, Laura's sorry. Laura's muted. Sorry, hold on. Um, Councilor, Mayor, Councilor Mayori. Okay, everyone get ready to unmute. Yes. Okay. Um, Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. And Councillor Labarge. Yes. Okay. The motion to postpone to April 2nd passes unanimously. So that we have now postponed. Um, thank you everyone for that discussion. Okay. Let me find where I was. Um, okay, moving on. We're at 19.178. Zone change petition to rezone three right avenue uh, from URC urban residential C to G uh, general business. This is the first reading. I am going to um, read it and ask for a motion. Um, I'm going to note that um, legis this. Uh, went to the planning board and legislative matters. Um, and there was a public hearing held um, and it was given a positive recommendation from legislative matters. Um, okay, so let me pull it up. Hmm. Oh, this one's, okay. Okay, the petition. So I'm gonna read, I'm gonna read the, the petition. Um, I'm repeating myself over and over. It's different than what they look like. So give me a sec. Uh, a, a petition for amendment to the zoning map um, pursuant to general law, chapter 43, subsection 5 unregistered voters in the city of Northampton petitioned the city council to change the zoning district for the vacant lot at 3 Wright Avenue from the current zoning URC district to the adjoining GB zoning district. To amend the zoning map of the city of Northampton to include property 3 Wright Avenue map 39A lot 18 zoning district change from URC to match the adjoining Con Street property owned by the same owner Gretna Green Development Corp in the GB Zoning District. Um, and it is signed by those 10 residents. Um, there's a map that might be most helpful. Is there anything else that would be helpful for me to read? I'd like to make a motion to uh, approve, please. Second it. Okay, the motion's been made and seconded, made by, uh, Councilor, seconded by Councilor Labarge. And uh, back. Yes. <coughs> which screens? Mm -hmm. um, okay. Let's just remain seconded discussion. Um, and, or would we like to hear from Carolyn first or council discussion? Councilor Dwight. I, I um, spare Carolyn, I think for, I mean, we heard in legislative matters, there's a simple petition to allow a change that this is site specific to a, a parking lot that's, or a property that's uh, proximate to NETA, the marijuana dispensary. 
and they need the zoning change in order to allow parking. And given the fact that some of the parking pressures are, have stimulated a number of conversations already this evening, um, this is a way to alleviate some of the challenges that have uh, developed under around the popularity of uh, marijuana dispenser, which was since gone down from when they first opened. But if we if we approve this, then they um, NETA people have an agreement with the property owner to uh, convert it to uh, parking for NETA customers that would take some pressures off uh, proximate streets in the neighborhoods there. Yeah. And Karen will correct me if I'm wrong. You're muted, Carolyn, if you're going to correct yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> So now you're absolutely right. This is a petition by the property owner. They actually have come through the planning board already to get approval for the parking for um, to expand their employee parking. Um, so that's already been permitted, and I think they're moving forward. But it certainly makes it much easier um, to combine to have those properties combined if they're all the same zoning instead of having a split zone parcel. And within, I should also say, within the planning board approval, there was the required um, buffer that's um, in the zoning that's um, required between commercial uses and residential uses, and that's shown on the property too. So it's not going to there, there. There'll be some landscaping that sort of protects the um, remaining properties that are in the urban residential C district as this property gets pulled into this um, uh, general business district. Okay, thank you. Counselors, questions? Yeah, I have to agree with this ordinance. Um, I think it's going to benefit many of the side streets of eliminating overcrowding of parking, which we all know that we've had that problem off of Con Street. And I, I think this is excellent for um, what um, Greta Green wants to do here by doing an amendment and making it a parking lot in an agreement with NIDA. Thank you. You're welcome. Other counselors? Questions or comments? Further discussion on this? Okay. Seeing and hearing none, uh, Laura, when you're ready, roll call. Okay. Councillor Nash. I'm so I'm so sorry. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Uh, Councillor Shara. Oh, sorry. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Uh, Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. <laughs> yes. Councillor Jarrett? Yes. Councillor LaBarge? Yes. And Councillor Maori? Yes. Okay, that passes in first reading. Moving on to 20.004, an ordinance to rezone nine Con Street parcels from ND neighborhood business to CB central business. Uh, this is first reading. I'm going to read it and then ask for a motion. Um, this was also referred to planning board and legislative matters. Uh, planning board had their hearing um, and uh, um, sorry, I'm just reading the note. Um, oops, oh, there we go. Um, uh, planning board had a hearing. Uh, city council adoption was not recommended by them originally because the di design guidelines were not in place, but an ordinance has since been brought forward. Um, so their concern has been, um, was addressed. Um, and then legislative matters had a public hearing and gave it a positive recommendation on March 9th. So read it. In the year 2020, upon the recommendation of Mayor David J. Narkowitz, and planning and sustainability. 
20.004, an ordinance to rezone nine Con Street parcels of NUD, neighborhood business, NUD, central business. An ordinance of the city of Northampton, Massachusetts, providing that the code of ordinance for the city of Northampton, Massachusetts, be amended by changing section 350-3.0 to rezone some parcels in neighborhood business to central business. Be it ordained by the City Council of the City of Northampton in City Council assembled as follows. Amend the zoning maps as shown. Rezone map IDs along Con Street from neighborhood business to central business. 32C-102, 32C-104, 32C-105, 32C-131, NB portion only, neighborhood business portion only. Uh, 39A-002, 39A-003, 39A-004, 39A-008, 39A-009. Move to approve. Motion's been made by Councilor Dwight. Second. Show me a hand. Who is that? Uh, Councilor Quinlan. Seconded by Councilor Quinlan. Um, okay. Motion's been made and seconded. Discussion. Councilor Dwight is, oh, we lost you, but there you are, and you're ready to talk to us. Yeah, okay, there we go. Uh, Laura, if you get a chance, can you um, bring up a map, too, that's a part? That's sure. a part um, for folks who are just tuning in on this issue. Um, once again, this has, actually has a project specific that kind of generates some discussion about it. Um, uh, there are There is the property that's known as the Deuce, a.k.a. the World War II Club. It is about to change. He's prospectively changing ownership. That's the only the only pros and cons that I've heard relative to this zoning change. So not, I haven't heard anything relative to any of the other properties that are being considered. Um, we've also received emails. There was testimony in legislative matters. I would say the vast majority of testimony was pro in legislative matters. Although there were there was uh, there were a couple of uh, butter concerns, um, uh, and there have since been. There's another new butter concern, or approximate butter. It wasn't actually a legal butter, but someone was in the neighborhood who wrote us a letter, who also expressed concern about the activity that goes on, or has gone on at the World War II Club, adversely impacting their quality of life. Um, Councilor Murphy, former Councilor David Murphy, uh, is his concerns are relative to another issue that we're going to vote on that's tied into this, which is the architectural design standards. His concern about it being applied um, is in his uh, uh, in a summation. It's just basically uh, trying to put a square peg in a round hole. Doesn't doesn't necessarily. It's not necessarily appropriate by his his reckoning, and um, I hope Carolyn will have an opportunity to speak to that because I did ask her directly about that in uh, legislative matters. And once again, I want to point out that when we do these things, it's not project specific. It shouldn't be. Um, it is. I mean, the last thing we just voted on was clearly project specific. It was related to one property. In this instance, we are making a law that will be tied into this zoning regardless of who's there, regardless of what businesses who function there. Um, that um, I actually have always been an advocate for expanding central business, personally, particularly in this way towards the gateway uh, that's, that is designated Northampton's gateway area to create a continuum from the gateway to downtown to allow for um, the flexibility the central business zoning affords to some anomaly properties there that that uh, probably before the zoning exists just sort of popped up and rent without much in the way of restrictions or limitations. Um, I do think this makes sense. The concerns, of course, if you're looking at the map, you'll see that there are a number of residential ho uh, properties, houses uh, scattered in between. They're not part of this consideration. They're, uh, they will not be folded into that, into, into this, and be impacted in that way. The, the discussion was 
Uh, one of the concerns that was expressed by a resident in legislative matters was would this render their property in central business, a house that's been in their family for generations, would they suddenly have to uh, put retail on the ground floor and uh, only have residential on the top? And that does not, this does not apply to them. And, and mm -hmm. um, it, it shouldn't be a concern in this conversation. Relative to the issues of a club, um, uh, there, there's all sorts, of, anomaly doesn't begin to describe what, what's going on here, but essentially this property where the, where the deuce is um, actually should be central business. Um, whether it becomes uh, a nightclub or whether it becomes, uh, a, you know, a, a dog grooming spot or, uh, you know, or a, a, a small grocery store or something like that. I think it, it makes sense that, uh, that we, the central business should be and all the criteria that qualify at a central business be applied here. So, that was that was consensus. I think it was a unanimous approval from the legislative matters. Thank you. Um, other comments or Carolyn, did you want to? You're muted. Hold on. Ah, okay. Oops. <laughs> Wait. Okay. I'm not, I'm good. Okay. Um, so, Councillor um, Dwight sort of uh, outlined um, his um, thoughts about how this is a gateway corridor and we should think about central business um, along the, these, this corridor as well as Pleasant Street. In fact, the city has looked um, um, a number of years ago, there was a proposal to rezone these same parcels. Um, and there, at the time, there wasn't a proposal to um, for a sale at the World War II Club. It was um, unrelated to that at all. But um, there was a concern that if central business expanded all the way down Con Street with the associated central business architecture review criteria, that there might be a little bit of a mismatch in terms of the types or the design review process for properties in this area um, as compared to what the process is um, or the evaluation tools that are used for the rest of the central business district. So I think it was eight or nine years ago, um, the expansion um, actually stopped at where Paradise Copies is. So that yellow finger that comes down Con Street at the very edge is actually the edge of the Paradise Copies um, property. And so that was the extent of the expansion um, those years ago. And, and it was sort of truncated not to include what's now before you on Con Street. So this hasn't been something that just appeared and is in a vacuum today. Um, the city has looked at options for expanding central business down Con Street and Pleasant Street for a number of years. So um, that's why we feel it's not out of um, character to look at this now. And of course now, meaning before we um, um, adopt a form-based code, which we've been working on in parallel track, um, in which we are looking at creating um, sort of sub-districts where design specific criteria would be different depending on whether you're on a gateway or on Main Street. Um, so we feel like this is um, coming forward a little bit sooner than what we had thought, but it still makes sense given the request um, that and the concerns about this anomaly use at the former World War II Club or World War II Club. So um, uh, now what's in front of you is the zone change for central business. Um, and later on the agenda is the related expansion of the design guidelines. The design guidelines for central business architecture actually do um, provide for um, allowances to look at buildings that are um, different than those buildings in the core central business. So there are elements of that that, that actually do make sense for the concert area, but we could get into that discussion later. Um, so that's sort of it in, the, in a nutshell. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, Caroline, um, I wanted to ask you, so in other words, 
any new design standard would not impact any of these existing nine parcels. Is that what I'm hearing? Or so, is a new de- or or would a new design standard only impact new projects of new additions? Right. So anytime there's a change in the exterior facade of a building, um, then we look at it in the context of those design criteria. So if nobody's proposing a change to a building, then nothing. There would be no um, reason to evaluate that. Okay. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh-huh. Okay, I see Garrett with his hand up. Oh. Um, Carolyn, uh, can you talk about the form-based code and the plans for that and how that would affect the central business architecture um, commission designation, central business architecture designation? Would the form-based code supersede that or would they coexist? No, the idea is to um, create sort of a unified um, development review code that um, absorbs the current central business architecture guidelines, but adds to it. So it would replace what we have now um, into sort of a different format. So, you know, making the change now to central business won't affect the ability to come back later and rezone this um, central, um, you know, change the name and the design and the criteria that would be associated with a form-based code if the city council, you know, adopts that or moves forward on that. Okay. Other questions? For comments. Okay. Oh, it. Sorry. Um, yeah, I just wanted to speak uh, in favor of this in terms of the expansion of the central business district. I think will bring more opportunity for mixed use development, uh, more walkable, and um, more, you know, more. Uh, more you know residences and uh, above and retail below and and uh, in the downtown area I think that's that's very appropriate um, and you know the, with the regards to the World War II club I think it has functioned uh, as a nightclub for decades and and brings value to the community and um, the residents in the area uh, I think knew this in you know, knew the World War II Club was there in moving in, and I, it doesn't seem like there will be a detrimental, you know, that, that this, this change will cause it to be detrimental. Um, it will continue with a similar function that is already existing. Thank you. Other comments from counselors? Okay, seeing none, um, uh, roll call when you are ready, Laura. Okay, Councillor Shara? Yes. Councillor Thorpe? Oop, oh, you're muted. Oops. Hold up. Count, oops, Councillor Thorpe was. Can you hear me? Yes, now. No, I can. Yes. Councillor Dwight? Yes. Councillor Foster? Yes. Councillor Jarrett? Yes. Councillor Labarge? Yes. Councillor Maori? Yes. And Councillor Quinlan? Yes. Okay. That passes unanimously in first reading. Moving on to 20.005, an ordinance to amend zoning map on Old South Street and Clark Avenue. Um, I'm going to read it and then I will ask for a motion. Um, This was also referred to planning and legislative matters. Planning had their hearing and gave it a positive recommendation in February. And then legislative matters also held a public hearing on on, uh, March 9th and 
gave it a positive recommendation. Um, okay, in the year 2020, upon the recommendation of Mayor David Jennifer's and Chairman of Sustainability, uh, an ordinance to amend the zoning map on Old South Street and Clark Avenue, an ordinance of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts, providing that the Code of Ordinances, City of Northampton, Massachusetts, be amended by amending Section 350-3.4 of the zoning map to change the boundary between Central Business CB and Urban Residential C, uh, URC zoning districts. Be it ordained by the City Council of the City of Northampton and City Council assembled as followed, amend subsection 350-3.4 zoning map to expand the limits of Central Business CB zoning district behind the first set of homes on Old South Street in Clark Avenue on a portion of map ID 38A-222, 223, and 224, as shown below. This change to keep the homes on Old South Street and Clark Avenue within the urban residential C zoning district, but would expand the CB central business district slightly in the rear yards of those homes. And the map is up right there. So I'm looking for a motion, please. Move to approve, please. Second. It's been made by Councilor Light, and I believe Councilor Jarrett seconded it. Discussion. Um, uh, Councilor Dwight. So I would defer to uh, Carolyn uh, to give the explanation on this. Sure. So, um, this was an area uh, that we had been working with the property owners on to think about development opportunities at the back of the roundhouse parking lot and with access from the roundhouse parking lot. And so um, currently you, you can see that already the rear portion of these parcels are zoned central business. This would merely push that line back to essentially right at the border of the structures that exist on um, Old South Street. So those houses would, their multifamily houses would remain in the residential district, um, but the rear yards um, would have, there'd be a substantially larger portion that would be in the commercial zone. Um, the idea was to create more of a developable portion of those properties if the property owners um, were interested in pursuing something with access from the public parking lot. Um, so uh, the planning board also had a conversation about the expansion of the central business design standards. Um, they did not feel it was so critical to have those done now that we could wait till form based code. And the reason for that in this location is because they're already, the most rear portion of the parcels are already in the central business with that central business um, architecture um, criteria along with it. So they're subject now to those develop or design criteria as it sits. So they didn't have the same um, concern about that, um, the timing on that. Okay, thank you. Counselors. Question. Oh, Councillor Jarrett. Um, so, Carolyn, in the rear of that those lots, there would be a thirty-foot buffer uh, between the 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 lot the new line that is urban residential C and the central business in terms of where it could be developed. Yeah. So, as part of any development review. Um, the zoning does have a standard 30 foot um, buffer requirement between commercial and residential uses. Um, the planning board does have the jurisdiction to reduce that um, depth based on a, um, either inclusion of a fence or some other kind of landscaping that essentially accomplishes the same thing about creating a buffer between commercial and residential uses. But yes, that would be part of any, it wouldn't be triggered until and unless a project were proposed. But also given that the property owners are the same, or at least north, south, they're the same, uh, it's likely there would be agreement about any development 
so that I think, that could yeah, be reduced. Yeah. Uh, so um, the way that these parcels are put, it, I think the thing that makes the most sense is to do a combined project. So yes, the property owners would have to come together and agree on a project, and then and then you know the details could get hammered out. Um, the other, I know that uh, I'll be pretty sad to see that stand of trees go. Um, and, uh, but, you know, I, I know, I understand we have to have a balance between in town development and our urban trees. Um, and I, I would like to see more guidance from the tree commission. I'd like to see a strengthening of the significant tree ordinance. Um, so, I'm, and I'm in favor of this. It's it's. I just wanted to note that, you know, whenever I see a a, a large stand of trees that will likely be mo mostly removed, that I that I have a concern about that, and the concern that we are actively expanding our the urban tree can canopy in the downtown area, um, <clears throat> to to help replace those. Um, so I don't know if. if if you, Carolyn, have a th thought of the, the, what the planning department's thoughts are about about that, or if anyone else uh, yes, comment. Yeah, I mean, we do have a tree replacement requirement for any project um, where trees are removed uh, of a certain size. So that is in place in this area, it's in place throughout the city. Um, there are some trees that may need to be removed as it relates to the um, redesign of the parking lot anyway. Um, one of the things that um, the, I think the tree replacement requirement does do is um, it really um, encourages people to look at their design and see if there are ways to work around existing trees. Um, I think you're right, we need to look at um, where it makes sense to have trees in the urban in the urban core, um, the tree the public shade tree committee is has jurisdiction for public shade trees. This is private property, so they wouldn't be reviewing um, any um, tree removal that would happen on private property. Uh, but again, um, you know, I think it. Um, we also, we do need to think about planting new trees everywhere, not just, you know, preserving older trees. And I don't really know the, I don't know the character of these trees and sort of what size are, or, um, you know, their health status, but it is something that anyone would have to look at when they propose a project. Okay, thank you. Other... Other counselor. Okay, no, no further questions or comments. Okay, Laura, when you're ready, roll call, please. Councilor Thorpe. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Hold up. Councilor Dwight. He's coming. Working on it. Happy yes. 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 Councillor Foster. Yes. yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. And Councillor Shara. Yes. Okay. That passes in first reading. Um, moving on to 20.006, an ordinance to amend zoning map to add new smart growth overlay district at Laurel Street. That one is appropriate. I'm going to read it and ask for a motion. Um, just like the previous one, it was referred to planning and legislative matters. Planning had a hearing and gave it a positive recommendation on February 13th. And the legislative matters gave it a positive recommendation on March 9th. Okay. In the year 2020, upon the recommendation of Mayor David Jane Arkowitz and planning and sustainability, 
uh, an ordinance to amend a new smart growth organization at Long Street. An ordinance of the city of Northampton, Massachusetts, providing that the code of ordinances city of Northampton, Massachusetts be amended by amending section 350-3.4, the zoning map to add a new smart growth overlay district. Be ordained by the city council of the city of Northampton, city council assembled as follows, amend subsection 350-3.4 zoning map to add additional smart growth overlay C overlay district uh, SG-C, in addition to the existing three SG overlays overlaying on the existing planned village district PV on map ID 38A-049-001 as shown below. SG-C does not increase the allowed density. Uh, the existing PV has no minimum lot size frontage width, depth or setback requirements, but does allow Commonwealth smart growth overlay bonus to the city for affordable housing. Map 38A-049 has already been uh, dedicated to affordable housing by the city's state hospital reuse planning and the resulting state legislation. And the map is up. Um, move approval, please. Second. <clears throat> That's good. Motion's been made by Council Floyd and seconded by Councillor Labarge. Um, just got Councillor Dwight. Um, first of all, anyone who was listening to that who can actually translate it would be would get extra bonus points. I think that I mean, you know, this is just a general complaint. Usually when we we have these ordinances and zoning, there's there's a an alphabet soup of acronyms that I I think that we have difficulty keeping up with even with the definitions, and I think it's a. I I, I don't understand how a citizen who just came in on this discussion could make any sense of overlay district SG uh, small C in addition to the existing three SG overlays overlaying on the existing plan village PV. You get my drift, but anyway, so. Um, <laughs> I'm going to ask Carolyn to do the honors because actually this is a very good proposal that um, promises great benefits for the community and is in keeping with the discussion and the long discussion of 30 years or so of how Village Hill was going to manifest. So uh, Carolyn, take it away. <laughs> I will, and I'll try to break down those um confusing labels that I have to say is partially it's put upon us by the state. Oh, I know, I know. Um, so just taking a little bit of a step back, um, when the state hospital was um, um, allocated for redevelopment, there were some parcels that were um, specifically pulled out and, and allocated or dedicated to the Northampton Housing Authority for the purposes of creating affordable housing. Um, this one particular block, which is you know, 1.6 acres, um, was one of those and um, was not um, ever developed by the housing authority. So the state actually took back possession of the property because it wasn't built um, in a timely manner, built upon in a timely manner. So we're in the process of trying to retake that and having state um, legislation to grant it back to the city, but not to the housing authority, but to the city um, through the auspices of our um, block grant um, program, community development program, to be able to get um, that project built with affordable housing the way it was originally intended. Um, so that's the sort of the history of this parcel and why it hasn't, wasn't part of the overall redevelopment scheme by mass development for the redevelopment of the state hospital because it was not um, part of mass development's holdings for redevelopment there. Um, the various overlays that are shown here are were done back in 2007, the city um, exercised um, an incentive that the state provided for, create, for the purposes of creating housing and in particular, a mix of housing that's affordable as well as market rate. And so the smart growth overlays are specifically targeted 
um, by um, state, um, essentially a, a provision under the state statutes to create housing and more dense housing in places that make sense that are um, on our transportation networks close to centers. Um, so the smart growth overlays that are already exist at the state hospital were created shortly after the state created those incentive programs. And it's an incentive because if you get your state or your overlays for smart growth uh, approved by the state and then housing is built within those districts, then the state actually makes payments to the communities that have these this housing produced within those defined districts. So the, we've already as a city received payments from the state for housing that was built at the state hospital. And we've put those to, the idea is to take those incentive um, um, dollars and, and use them as um, ways to mitigate for new housing development. So we've put those into transportation design um, projects, um, particularly the whole Main Street um, redesign process is, um, has um, been able to move forward because we use funds from the state. So this little pocket of Smart Growth C is really just a request to the state to expand what we've already gotten approved as an um, overlay so that when housing is built in that area, the city will receive funds um, for each unit that is produced in that district. So that's why we want to come back to the um, council and um, get that defined so that we'll be ready to um, take advantage of those incentive dollars that the state has. Thank you. Uh, counselors, we're now in a different view. Oh, there we go, that's better. Okay, Councillor Thorpe. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. And just to be a little bit more specific, this falls under Massachusetts uh, General Laws, Chapter 40R, correct? That's right. Yeah. And 40R seeks to substantially increase the supply of housing and decrease its cost by increasing the amount of land zone for dense housing, correct? That's right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Other counselors? Yes, um, Councillor Shira, um, I am going to support this. Councillor Dwight and I, right from the beginning with the old Northampton State Hospital property, were involved with the beginning of the process. And I just think it is, and it is definitely another bonus for the city for affordable housing. And also the city will receive money from that. I think it's a creation that has done such wonders for affordable housing and for people to buy property at the old Northampton State Hospital. Thank you. Okay, let's see how my video does. Um, I just wanted to also speak um, in favor. I've had a chance to speak to a number of the residents who live on Laurel Street near this property. And, um, you know, the, it's interesting because we had you and then we lost them, um, you know, recognize that it's on a, hang on. I thought if I stopped my video, maybe that would help. Is oh, that better? No. Sure, yes. Is that better? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Less internet. All right. So I've, I've had a chance to talk to a number of people who live near this property as well. And overall, the feeling in the neighborhood is very positive and very um, supportive uh, in recognizing that it's, that's an area that's close to town on public transportation. Um, and it's a neighborhood that that is, um, you know, overall, uh, you know, ready to em embrace um, more dense housing um, coming in as well. Great, thank you. And then, and that did work. Uh, turning off your video did make that much clearer. So thank you. Uh, good work. Um, counselors, anyone else? Um, okay, seeing no further comment. Um, Laura, roll call when you are ready. Counselor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. 
Councillor Labarge? Yes. <clears throat> Councillor Maori? Yes. Councillor Quinlan? Yes. Councillor Shara? Yes. And Councillor Thorpe? Yes. Hey, that passes uh, unanimously in first reading. Moving on to um, 20.024, an ordinance to change EBAC, uh, Central Business Architectural, what's the C? Um, committee, it's no? Sign committee, yeah. Yeah, committee. Map to include Pond Street lots rezoned to CB. Uh, this is in first reading. I'm going to read it, ask for a motion. This was referred to legislative matters and which gave it a positive recommendation with a split vote. I was the one, uh, the one, um, no vote. Um, and I'm going to read it now. Okay. Uh, in the year 2020, upon the recommendation of Mayor David J. Narco with Planning and Sustainability 20.024, an ordinance to change CBAC map to Pons Street lots rezoned to CB. The ordinance of the City of Northampton Massachusetts by the Code of Ordinances uh, City of Northampton Massachusetts be amended by changing Section 156-2 CBAC map to parcels to be rezoned from um, MB to CB along Pond Street. Be it ordained by the City Council, the City of North Carolina, the City Council assembled as follows. Among the CBAC map, as shown, map ID uh, along Pond Street, 32C-102, 32C-104, 32C-105, 32C-130, current MB portion only, 39A-002, 39A-003, 39A-004, 39A-008, 39A-009. And Laura is pulling up the map. Okay. Is there a motion? Move to approve, please. Second it. Motions are made by Councilor Dwight, seconded by <coughs> Carolyn, you've spoken to this a little bit um, already, but uh, anything else that you'd like to say to it? Um, I think, um, the, you know, the, I think the concerns that I heard from both, um, the planning board hearing and legislative matters hearing was, uh, over what the specifics in the central business architecture design criteria would, um, how those would affect properties. And that, um, you know, I think uh, former Council Murphy, Murphy certainly um, uh, was concerned that those guidelines were initially created to really focus on the main spine, Main Street and Pleasant Street. And so the, the design character of those streets is much different than the um, buildings and the character represented along Con Street and Pleasant Street. However, as uh, um, the design guidelines embedded within them actually include per, um, provisions and allowances for addressing buildings that are not um, landmark buildings or what we refer to as theme commercial buildings, but in fact um, have specifically address what's referred to as either transitional residential buildings. So those buildings that were originally built as residences but have transitioned to um, commercial use, um, but still have that residential character. There are also specific criteria for review um, um, focused on what is referred to anomaly buildings. Those buildings um, like some of the medical buildings that are on Con Street within this block that are proposed for re to be rezoned. Um, and so there is there are provisions within those standards to address those type, those character buildings. Um, and uh, so I think that even though um, this area is very different than Main Street, there's still allowances for um, a variation of architectural styles and review options for those uh, properties. 
Okay. Uh, since I'm the person who voted against it in legislative matters, I'll um, I'll speak to that and um, so and and actually ask Carolyn a question. Um, so so you just you just sort of outlined who uh, which buildings this wouldn't apply to, but it would still apply to the residences um, that haven't been converted to another use that are still residences. Yes. Right, there are two buildings, I believe, within that block that are um, multi-unit residences, or at least a two-family. Um, and then, of course, there's um, Councilor Murphy's building that we still refer to as architecturally, it's a transitional residential style of building, even though the first floor is commercial. Um, so there are, um, there's quite, a lot of leeway or allowances for modifications to um, residential style buildings within the guidelines. Um, and again, it only relates to um, situations in which someone wants to modify the exterior of a building that's visible from the street. So if the front facade of one of those buildings were proposed to be expanded or um, changed in some way. The guidelines are very liberal in terms of allowing those changes to happen. Um, the biggest um, issue that these design guidelines address is, is um, the area of window opening. So it's very, um, it encourages lots of windows on the street uh, to create that interface between the public street and the private um, building. So if someone were to propose blocking up windows on the first floor that front the street, that would not, that would trigger a view by the Central Business Architecture um, Committee because um, the goal would be to try to maintain as much of that window opening as possible. But other than that, um, there, there's a wide range of opportunity for people to modify their structures um, without necessarily needing to even go before the committee for review. Um, so you gave an example in legislative matters about siding. Um, so would, would there be restrictions on what kind of siding or choices that those residences will have, would have to make? Um, so it only, only to the extent that it varies the, um, actually you can, for a transitional residential structure, you can make a lot of modifications to the exterior of a building, so long as you're not closing up windows without review. The idea is that, um, I think this came up in the context of if you're changing the, um, uh, the appearance of a building significantly, that might trigger review from the committee. But siding per, in and of itself wouldn't necessarily, wouldn't trigger review, most likely. The changing of that, you know, materials. Okay. Um, so maybe I, maybe the concern that I had um, isn't warranted. My concern was that you have relatively few residences on the street, which is already not architecturally consistent. And right that applying these standards to these residences could, you know, could potentially have a financial, financial cost associated with them for the owners. So that, um, and not only would it have financial costs associated with meeting those standards, but it, it wouldn't then provide sort of um, the architectural consistency that maybe this was meant to, um, to you know, have help have happen, right? Right. It isn't consistent. So asking them to do this would be a burden without um, the, without achieving the goal. Right. Um, so I think, um, so it is true, the intent, the original intent of these guidelines were focused on more of the core main street and then the side street community off of the street. Um, however, um, over time, the central business boundaries have changed. So we've had these um, design standards in place for over 20 years. 
And over that time, we've tweaked the, the boundary edges to incorporate more um, buildings within it. And um, so I think that necessarily means that there are many more buildings that um, don't necessarily match the character that's on Main Street or Masonic, just, you know, that intersects with Main Street, those, those um, core side streets. Um, that's, in fact, um, one of the reasons we're looking at um, creating a form-based code that looks at creating sub-districts um, because the um, idea is that there are different ways that um, downtown has developed architecturally and, and in terms of the uses. So the goal ultimately is to sort of create something that, that is better suited for our downtown. Um, but in the interim, we have these other standards that have been in play for over 20 years. Um, so, um, you know, going back to your residential um, character piece, there are exemptions in the central business guidelines specifically for alteration or renovation to transitional residential buildings. And, um, and really the, the focus is as long as it doesn't change or reduce the area of window openings, um, basically everything else is allowed. And it's and that's for the purposes of allowing transition of use from originally a residential character to more of a commercial use and, and also acknowledging that over time, people's needs change for their, their space that they're um, occupying. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not meant to be something that imposes um, additional prohibitions on, on structures. Okay, thank you. That, uh, that helps alleviate my concerns. Um, other counselors. Nope. Okay. Seeing uh, Councilor Labarge, I'm just going to check in. Any? Nope, I'm fine. Okay. Then, um, Laura, roll call, please, when you're ready. Councilor Foster? Yes. Councilor Jarrett? Yes. Councilor Labarge? Yes. Councilor Maori? <laughs> yes. Councilor Quinlan? Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Okay, that passes in first reading. Um, I don't know of any new business, but I just want to take a second to Thank everybody. We, you all are troopers. Uh, shout out to the people who stuck with us who aren't counselors or aren't um, representatives from the city uh, during this whole this whole evening. Um, thank you, thank you for being patient with this this first try at this new method. Um, I think I think we really all should feel feel good about about. <laughs> Schlogging through tonight. It was it was long. Um, so well done, everybody. And um, before we adjourn, uh, be safe and be well. So, is there a motion? I move to adjourn. Second. Second it. Second. All in favor of adjourning, please say aye. 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 Thank you very much, everyone. We are adjourned. Thank you very much. Yes. Good night. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Laura. Good night.